to. Hmm? The courtroom is ready. We're ready. So just usual. I believe Quincy is not going to be in. Sorry. I don't think Chris. Quincy. No. begin by making clear to the court that I be aware, the unusual gravity of this application and the injustice that the claimants are asking the court to sanction. Two principal reasons for this which I shall develop in a minute. The first, the claimants have made serious allegations, including allegations of dishonesty against professional persons, which bring these communications that we are concerned with directly into issue and which cannot fairly be determined, we submit, without reference to them. And to be absolutely clear, these allegations are entirely denied by the defendants, who are very concerned this case has been advanced, not in the instruction of Sheikh Khalifa at all, because of his incapacity, but by others uh, without knowledge. But whether that's right or not, the issue of dishonesty and the issue of knowledge is absolutely central to all aspects of this case, put in issue by the claimant. And the second aspect, and I'm sorry to raise the temperature uh, so soon, but there's really no way of sugarcoating that, is the claimants have pleaded a particular claim which we say is demonstrably untrue. And the consequence of allowing the appeal is that they will be given a license to continue with that untruth and potentially mislead the court. And that was a real concern of Mr. Justice Ross as well. Uh, this is one of these cases, Lord, starting at the end, like a maths problem, that if privilege is the answer, then the workings have gone wrong. And, and that's clear also, we submit, from some of the rather arresting answers that my own friend, in a sense, had to give to your ship's questions this morning uh, as to what would and wouldn't be excluded. Uh, we say it's clear that isn't the answer and the application of existing principles, or, or as Mr. Justice Ross said, a very small extension of one of the existing principles, provides a number of overlapping bases on which the court can resolve the appeal without, we say, very much difficulty, without the destruction of the well prejudice privilege rule. Uh, um, uh, let me make good the two points I just made. First, on materiality and falsity. Your lordships are aware of what happened in the mediation. 
the context was for a, 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 a claim by Lancer for a capital performance fee, uh, a claim was for £75 million. Pounds. The parties entered into the formal mediation process and exchange statements. In the course of the Lancer statements, your lordships will have seen them, they made reference to a number of matters, and I can just enumerate them for the moment. First, there was an agreement to pay, I seem to have called them Dr. Mubarak, I hope you won't mind, out of the increased fees paid by the claimant. Secondly, that these payments were made to Becker Services Limited, or whatever the company was. Third, that Becker was Dr. Mubarak's company. And fourth, the quantum of the payments, which was about £27 million at the time, it increased after. Those matters were disclosed in the mediation statements. Uh, the claimant's response was not to engage with any of them at all. In fact, they said they're all irrelevant to the, the claim in the mediation. Now, as your lordships know, the parties with whom these documents were exchanged uh, included Dr. Abbas, who we say was the personal lawyer to Sheikh Khalifa, uh, and Evershed's, who were then and are, and it's perhaps surprising, but anyway, are still the claimant's lawyers. Now, the claimants pursue a number of causes of action and make specific allegations, several of which we submit bring directly into issue the content of these communications. Uh, uh, there are a number of them, but I, can, I shall identify three. And you all should see the point. First, the fundamental contention that the claimants did not know either the quantum of the payments, the 27 million, or that Becker was owned by Mubarak until 2017. Uh, that allegation is, in a sense, the central pillar to this claim for unauthorized uh, commissions or bribes. Uh, that lack of knowledge is pleaded in unequivocal terms throughout the pleading. Uh, I think your, lordship has been sh your lordships have been shown uh, certainly the further information. Uh, we won't go to it now. But in a number of places, the particulars of claim, the further information, and the reply, on various occasions, it's pleaded in terms they only acquired knowledge of those matters in 2017. When I say that, well, actually, maybe we should look at it, just to so see. If you go to the further information, which is tab four of bundle two, uh, page 40. Page 40, request, uh, response to request 3 to 4, and it's the large paragraph about halfway down on that basis. They admit to certain knowledge in 2011, but then plead that they, they did not acquire until 2017 the following knowledge, and your lordship can see as set out in POC 36, there was no disclosure to them, one, that Becker was beneficially owned by Dr. Alababi, or two, that payments previously made to Becker had been funded by the claimants themselves out of the new fees and Schedule 3 increases. Now, the reason I take your lordships to that is the matter was said in terms in the mediation statements. So that the pleaded cases, they had no knowledge of those matters until 2017. Uh, I will return in a minute to the very unsatisfactory pleading on attribution. But on any view, we submit a pleading that the claimants did not know something until 2017 is a pleading that they did not know those things in 2012. It is a pleading that they were not told those things in 2012. It doesn't have to be expressly set out, but an allegation of lack of knowledge necessarily embraces, as a precondition, absence of knowledge on a preceding occasion. Hence, we submit, any knowledge in fact obtained in the mediation is brought directly into issue to admissibility by that of Berman. It's a necessary component of the pleaded case. There was no knowledge of these matters in 2012. So that's knowledge. The, the second uh, part of the case where we say they brought into play the content of the mediation is the allegation that the deed of variation and the deed of settlement, these are the 2012 documents which were agreed after the mediation, the allegation that they were signed by Mubarak in fraud of the claimants, and that the defendants acted dishonestly <coughs> in colluding with Dr. Mubarak in respect of those documents. That's the nature of the claim, and that's the basis of the claim for all the payments, for a return of all the payments made after and pursuant to those documents. 
It's also part of the general dishonesty claim, but focusing for the moment just on the 2012 claim. Um, as you still have the supplementary bundle, can we go to tab six, um, the particulars of claim? Uh, paragraph 46, see the allegation as put. And this is in connection with the 2012 documents of immediately consequential upon or consequential upon the remediation. <coughs> uh, paragraph 64, sorry, page 64, paragraph 46. So the structure of the pleading, as we know, is that Dr. Mubarak was acting in fraud of his principle, that claimants dishonestly knew about that and didn't uh, stop it or didn't re reveal it. And the, the principal allegation at 46, you can see at the bottom, if no one has belief that Dr. Ababi was authorized, he were acted recklessly, etc. So that's the components of the dishonesty claim alleged against the defendants for assisting, I think there's a knowing assistance claim as well, for assisting Dr. Mubarak in his fraudulent scheme. As for the detail of that allegation, if you go to 47, there are various allegations of knowledge. Um, I think a lot of these essentially are conclusory allegations of knowledge, but if you Focus for the moment on 47.3. As part of the allegation of, uh, of dishonesty, as a result, any honest person would have made inquiries directly of the claimant's directors before proceeding. No such inquiries were made. So that's the pleaded case of supporting a claim of dishonesty. And, and obviously it begs the question, what inquiries should have been made? Uh, we get the answer, or we get some of the answer, if you go to the reply at tab 9. This is it. I'll do this too in a minute. If, tab 9, if you can pick it up, please, at page 153. This is the section 32 pleading where the allegation is of deliberate concealment. And at 30.4, the matters deliberately concealed uh, material facts and, and just pick up two of them at least there 30.4.1.2 30.4.1.3 uh, that Becker was beneficially owned by a party and the amount of fees so those are matters being dishonestly uh, concealed deliberately concealed and going back to the inquiries if you go across the page to 30.4.5 um, uh, feel like that um, the defendants failed in connection with the side letter of the March 2011 agreement and the 2012 deeds, so we're in the context of, of the 2012 deeds against the mediation, to make the inquiries that would have been made by an honest person. Such sorry, which, which paragraph? Sorry, on page 154, 30.4.5. Okay, thank you. They failed to make the inquiries an honest person would make. Such <coughs> inquiries would have required them to disclose their material facts, or well, we know what those are, to the directors of the claimant, alternatively the shareholders of the claimants, which they did not. Underline, underline, we would submit, which they did not. So there is a, a specific allegation of a failure to give disclosure in the context of 2012 um, deeds. And we say, as for the allegation of knowledge, that's not limited in time. It's, it, it's not, it doesn't say, you didn't give disclosure in a period outside the mediation. It's an allegation of failure to give disclosure at any time before, during, and after the mediation. That's why it brings into play necessarily a failure to give disclosure in the mediation. That's the case. Uh, and the third, the third aspect is a similar aspect on this page on limitations specifically, the allegation of deliberate concealment. Um, they deliberately concealed those material facts uh, and they, uh, you can see 30.4.8, the claimants didn't discover those material facts until 2017. So um, each of those cases, we have knowledge, disclosure, embracing the 2012 period, express uh, overtly. They don't mention it, but it's a necessary component of the case. And the, so therefore, the first vice of this application is that the claimants have made these serious and specific allegations, which put an issue what the claimants knew in 2012 what the claimants were told in 2012, what the defendants did or did not reveal in 2012. And having put these matters in issue in this claim, they now wish to handicap the court and the defendants by excluding evidence directly responsive to those allegations, which they have asked the court to determine. 
Uh, I'll, I'll explain how we submit that fits into the exceptions, but this is the context of the case. The, the second vice is that not only have they put these matters directly in issue, but they have pleaded a case which, as we submit, is unequivocally false. Uh, two aspects to mention again. First, the central question of knowledge. Uh, and if you can go back, please, to uh, Mr. Quest did see deal with this to some extent, but I'll go back and read it if I made to tab four of, of the bundle. <coughs> and page, it's page 40, the same request. Uh, and clearly there is going to be a case of, at least, well, I say clear there is. In any corporate transaction, attribution is something to which the court will have regard. Uh, and in the first paragraph of the re response to request three to four, they say, uh, the claimants say, well, it's all a matter of attribution. No, I mean, so, so far, so good. If you then turn over the page, 41, what they say at number three, uh, particularly at the end of number three, the avoidance of doubt, the claimants advance no case and make no admission or assertion as to, and look at the third sorry, one. Sorry, I'm off. Sorry, sorry I'm right. going too fast. Page 41. Yes. Um, third of the way down, number three. Yes. Last sentence of the text. Oh, yes, I heard it. The avoidance of doubt, the claimants advance no case and make no admission or assertion as to dot 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 whether any such belief or knowledge of the solicitors is to be attributed to any of the claimants for the purpose of their claims. So it isn't a case where they put attribution in issue. Expressly, overtly, they don't. Their pleaded case can only be on, on those form that formulation of words that the claimants did not know whether or not the knowledge of the solicitors is attributed, because they're expressly making no case either way. They're not putting forward to this court, my other friend said, there may be an issue in future. There isn't an issue on these pleadings. At the moment, they are putting no case forward on attribution. Their case can only be, as pleaded, with a statement of truth. The claimants did not know whether or not there was a case of attribution, because that, they pleaded nothing else. And therefore, they did not know, even on the premise, that there was attribution. That must follow from the way it's pleaded. We know the solicitors had the knowledge at the time of mediation. We know there's no case about attribution. That's why this, this pleading cannot work. And this is what Mr. Justice Roth will see it thought as well. The pleaded case doesn't work. And it isn't an answer. This was said before Mr. Justice Roth and this morning, oh, well, if it's admissible, I might plead a case in attribution. Because the rule of without prejudice privilege is a rule of admissibility, not existence. If the matters exist, you cannot plead this case on that basis. It was down to the claimants, had they wished to do so, to assert non-attribution or not, as the case may be. Of course, we don't know whether there is a case of non-attribution or whether one could even be formulated, given the fact that these were solicitors on the record for these parties. But that's another issue. We don't know if there is or isn't, or whether it will or won't be pleaded in due course. At the moment, it isn't. And that's why we say this pleading is a false pleading, because it pleads the absence of knowledge whether or not there's attribution to the solicitors. And we know the solicitors received the information. Therefore, as pleaded, it can't work. And the vice of it is, if this material is excluded, that's the pleading the judge sees. Similarly, the same point arises in respect to the limitation point we looked at, failure to disclose. We know it was disclosed to the solicitors, there's no case that the solicitors were not, that their knowledge was not attributed to uh, the uh, claimants. And on that point, my friend said there's a difference between knowledge and attribution for the purpose of setting aside, but on the purpose of, his lordship said, on the purpose of limitation, it's knowledge is the relevant question. And the pleading there is my clients deliberately conceal things by not disclosing to their claimants without a case of attribution. It doesn't work at the moment. Uh, and, and we say this is a a real problem in this case. I'm not saying there's any deliberate, obviously I'm not saying there's any deliberate shenanigans or behind the scenes dealings, but the trouble is the claimants were so determined never expressly to mention the mediation in, in, in these pleadings because they wished to run the argument based on Muller, you have to expressly mention it. They were so determined not to mention the, the express pleading, they've tied themselves in a knot and turned out with a pleading which is false. So it's a, it's a difficult conundrum to solve but they have they've sought to solve it in the wrong way because this pleading can't stand because it's not right. Uh, so 
that's why I introduced all this basic model. They put these things in issue. It has to be determined because they put them in issue. They've, they've pleaded a case which doesn't work, <coughs> which is, we say, false on the basis of what we know at the moment. Now, um, that's the introduction. If I can now go on to the exceptions. Uh, first, some general points about the exception, then we'll deal with them in turn, I hope. Uh, the first point is, as your lordships know, it's a judge-made rule uh, to which the courts have identified a non-exclusive list of exceptions, uh, namely, so far anyway, those identified by Lord Justice Robert Walker, plus additional accepti exceptions accepted or determined in Ocean Belt. Now, there's a, I think a small little debate this morning as to whether Ocean Belt created new exceptions or additions to existing exceptions. I don't imagine really anything matters about that at all, because the exception list isn't exclusive in any event. <coughs> but if it matters, um, can I just show you uh, Ocean Bulk for what it's worth at, at tab 19, what, number 119. Just two exceptions emerged in, in Ocean Bulk. The first was a rectification which was accepted by the parties, and the second was factual matrix, which was determined by the court. Uh, but I say, I'm almost embarrassed to raise this point, it doesn't seem to me to matter, but so that your lordships are aware of the, the reality, if you go to paragraph 33 of Ocean Bulk, uh, Lord Clark was determining, was referring to the rectification piece was agreed between the parties and, and approved or like endorsed by Lord Clark. And the way he describes it in the first, first sentence, it is not in dispute between parties that another of the exceptions to the rule is rectification. Now, whether that means it's a new exception or an addition to it, I don't believe it. it doesn't, it, it's never going to matter. And it's certainly not going to matter for your lordships as to whether or not we've got new ones or slightly broader existing ones. But uh, that's a non-exclusive list. Now, uh, the second point, these exceptions apply whatever the jurisprudential basis of the rule. Your Lordships are aware that there's a public policy jurisprudential basis and a contractual jurisprudential basis. Uh, but th th it's never been suggested that the exceptions are limited to one or the other. In fact, Unilever uh, was itself a case of contractual uh, exceptions, but yet they all apply. So th there's, no, there's no distinction between the underlying policy as regards the existence or otherwise of the exceptions. Uh, we've also referred in our skeleton to Instance and Denny. I think look, Mr. Justice Lloyd made that point as well, that all the exceptions apply, whatever the jurisprudential basis. Uh, the third point is the list is by definition not closed, uh, and nor are the summaries of Lord Justice Walker, albeit, albeit carefully expressed, to be read like a statute. Uh, they are merely descriptions of instances where an exception has been found to exist or ought to exist. Uh, but importantly, they are not all interrelated <coughs> uh, they do not, and in direct response to some of the submissions this morning, they do not all depend on impropriety or abuse of the without prejudice rule. Um, if you turn, please, to the, the case, which is tab 10 of the bundle. And I'm going to take you especially to, to it's page 244, uh, to uh, exception two and exception four. Um, uh, but of course, there are other exceptions too, which I don't think fitted into his schema. Uh, for example, section, uh, exception one, which is simply a broad exception as to whether there has been a concluded agreement or not. There's no question of abuse there. There's no issue as to who makes the claim or who doesn't make the claim. It, it's a matter of a fair resolution of that claim if it arises, I imagine, but it's an entirely neutral exception, not based on abuse for one minute. Uh, uh, equally, we would say the same applies for two and three, and also the wording of four, knowing that Lord Justice Walker must be careful with his words, is, is telling, we say, because the number four begins, apart from any concluded contract or estoppel, one part me X, Y, Z. So he's drawing a distinction between one, two, and three, the concluded contract is one and two, and the estoppel is at three. He's saying, apart from that, there's this exception for un unambiguous impropriety. Now, many of my friends' submissions this morning either merged exception two into exception four, or ended up where exception two was a subset of, of exception four. In a different world, maybe so. Not in this world, 
Um, one, two, and three are set out X apart from those, there's four. So one has to deal with them all diff uh, distinctly, to say there's an overall pattern. But to say that, well, you can interpret section, uh, exception two by interpreting section four, exception four, uh, simply isn't right as a matter of language, and certainly not right as a matter of way, as a matter of the way it's been put in the judgment. Um, so one does have to look at them all in turn, albeit as a coherent whole, but the idea they simply merge into each other and one can get lessons from one rather than the other is something on which caution ought to be exercised. Um, so the fourth general point that we submit is that in deciding whether a set of facts sub fits within an exception or in deciding, I suppose, the ambit of an exception, uh, the correct approach is that of the Supreme Court in Ocean Bank. And the question is always going to be whether there are justified distinctions of principle to justify the existence or the non-existence of the exception. Uh, I won't take your lordships to it, but it's paragraph 42, well, it's several places, but in particular paragraph 42 of Ocean, uh, Ocean Bar. That was the question that Lord Clark was asking. Uh, you, you accept exception one, you accept rectification. Is there a distinction of principle when it comes to factual matrix? What's when, it comes to when it comes to factual <coughs> matrix. Because the factual matrix question was the issue before the Supreme Court in Ocean Bar. And Lord Clark was saying, well, you've got exception one, is there an agreement? You accept a new exception, is there a rectification? Is there a distinction of principle between those fact patterns and a fact pattern involving a factual matrix argument? So the right approach isn't to say, well, these are set in stone. Obviously, not, it's not to say, throw them out with the baby with the bathwater. But it's to say, well, these are the starting point. It's non-exclusive. But is there a distinction of principle looking at different fact patterns? Uh, in interpreting or, or, if necessary, extending these. And that, we say, is the correct approach in dealing with these uh, exceptions. We do accept, of course, no friend's right, that there isn't a single test of what justice demands. Nevertheless, I would submit, if one looks at the, th this case from 30,000 feet, the guiding principle, and therefore we submit the touchstone of these exceptions, is where the interests of justice lie. And that's what Lord Griffith says in Russian Tompkins. You will get exceptions where the interests of justice lie. That is always good to be. It's not, the, it's not the test. It's too vague for a test for an exception to, to these rules. And that's why we have lists of exceptions rather than a broad test like that. I accept that. However, in, ex, in exploring these exceptions and working out whether one fits or not or where the exceptions boundaries should be, the overall interests of justice must, of course, be the touchstone in any consideration. And We'll move on to Mr. Justice Newey in his decision. He, he came <coughs> essentially to that conclusion as well. That his fact pattern wasn't the same as Muller. It's slightly different to Muller. But he's saying, well, the interest of justice mean I can apply it to this. So it's the touchstone, not the test. I think I put it that way. Um, equally to remember. Maybe it's a necessary, but not a sufficient condition for an exception. Uh, I'm trying to work out which way around that goes. Well, in other words, you, you won't. The courts won't create an exception unless it's one which justice requires, but it doesn't follow that uh, it will that it will have a general proposition that wherever justice requires it, there will be an exception. Well, I, I think I, I think I accept it that way. Yeah. But it but it's it's not as if one one applies the, these these exceptions with a blinker no. about where justice might end up. Uh, one has to have that as a as, as a consideration. But the, but the starting point is that the without prejudice rule is an exclusionary rule under which there is withheld from the court material which is relevant and which it would otherwise want to see in order to make a fair and just <coughs> determination of the issue. So uh, in that sense, there's, there's always injustice. Uh, uh, y yes. There might be said to be this common thread <coughs> to, through some, but not all, of the exceptions. Um, and that is that, that evidence of um, what transpires in the course of without prejudice negotiations, whether in a mediation or otherwise, is admissible uh, on issues as to the existence, the terms, the interpretation, or the enforceability of an agreement made uh, in con as, a, as a result of those without prejudice negotiations. Lord, that, that may be a theme for some of them. It doesn't really get into Muller, for example, but it may it be may, a theme. It may not get into Muller. It, it, it may, may not a, get into Muller. It, there may be a theme. I mean, we know that evidence is admissible as to whether a contract was made at all. So that's existence. We know, therefore, 
that evidence is admissible as to what those terms are, including rectifying a written agreement. We know, because Ocean Bulk establishes it, that um, evidence of anything said at the mediation or in the course of negotiations which forms part of the factual matrix is admissible uh, to the interpretation of the terms once those terms have been found. And we know, by virtue of exception two, that evidence is, at least in some circumstances, admissible as to whether the contract is enforceable. That creates actually a coherent sort of overarching category, if you like, into which a number of the exceptions may be said to fall. Lord, I, I agree with that. I, I, it may well be that those that the descriptions your ship gave. Uh, I'm not saying they cover all exceptions. No, it may well be that that they circle around exceptions one and two. Uh, and it may well be that one, two, and rectification, which is well, mentioned, and, and ocean bulk, of course, which isn't mentioned. <laughs> I, I was rather <laughs> assuming that they were within one and two. If, if they're, no, they're not, if they're they? one I mean, A and two A, I don't know. Strictly, they're not. Um, but, and as but, my lord remarked earlier, it required seven members of the Supreme Court to say that um, it did extend to uh, the factual matrix type evidence. Well, so I, I don't, I don't myself see it as clearly within the existing exceptions. Otherwise, ocean bulk wouldn't. You know, maybe right. It may well be that they are additional to that, but they, there's a there's a theme there, which goes to the. To the it's because it's the it's because what one's focusing on. I mean, this isn't to say there aren't other exceptions. I want to be clear about this. Um, it clearly doesn't. It, there are other exceptions, but the, the the common idea is it. It is the contract arrived at by virtue of the negotiation. That means that those evidence of those negotiations will, on these the topics I've mentioned, become admissible. Lord, yes, I can see that, and it may it may be that that's what Lord Clark was expressing, or at least had in mind when he was talking about distinctions of principle, because yes. uh, if you does it exist, what are its terms? Yes, exactly. It's all the same question, really, or, or a similar question. Point. Yeah, maybe I see that. And the, but the other thing to remember also, and your ship's right about being an exclusionary rule, of course, but um, as we cited in the Prudential case, which is tab 12, we don't need to turn it up, a decision, I think, the Vice Chancellor, the, the ECHR is also engaged with this rule. Um, and as he said, it's to be applied with restraint and in cases where the public interests are plainly applicable. So there's always going to be a balance to, to consider any stage. Has that decision been subsequently considered at all in this context? Uh, we are not aware that it has. Now, um, if I can now go on to the first exception, uh, I Unilever 2. Uh, and as your Lordships know, uh, the exception is described is that uh, without prejudice material admissible to show an agreement apparently concluded should be set aside on grounds of misrepresentation or, or undue influence. The judge concluded that was engaged either on its terms or by a small incremental and principled extension of it. We submit that, of course, we submit that is correct. The settlement and negotiations reached a purported agreement apparently concluded. The claimants now contend that by reason of Dr. Mubarak's fraud, the agent was unauthorized and hence the agreement was void or voidable. Uh, three points we submit to note here. First, uh, the case is one of fraud, characterized as dishonest breach of fiduciary duty. And it wasn't, I don't think it was argued that we don't fit into the fraud box. Uh, I'm not sure it could be argued, but to that extent, that, that's the case. It's a case of fraud. Uh, your Lordship raised a discussion this morning from the decision of Mr. Justice Simon as to whether the exception is engaged or would be engaged in a non-fraudulent misrepresentation doesn't arise on this case, but we would submit it, it ought to be engaged uh, on, on that exception, because the reason Mr. Justice Simon, we submit the reason Mr. Justice Simon concluded as he did, is that he made the mistake of effectively merging exceptions two and exceptions four. And if you read exception two through the prism of exception four, you come to that conclusion. But it's not what Lord Justice Walker said in exception two, and nor really, nor really makes sense. As Lord, 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 said earlier, if you're alleging 
a misrepresentation leading to the conclusion of a settlement agreement. It's a very strange outcome if you can look into the misrepresentation if you allege fraud. You can't look into the misrepresentation if you allege negligence, for example. It doesn't, it's not a principal <coughs> reason for a distinction between the two. So if it matters, in terms of trying to work out a structure for this, we do submit Mr Justice Simon with respect as wrong. And on any view, Lord Justice Robert Walker no doubt had all forms of equitable fraud in mind as well as common law fraud. I mean, his reference to undue influence really makes that clear beyond argument. Yes, of course, of course. So it, it, it's one of those situations, when I said earlier that that, that isn't a statute, of course, he mentioned three things, and there could no doubt be other species of equitable uh, or, or, or basis yes. on which... Or, or there could be duress. Indeed. Or, or any other basis, to go back to what you all have said, if it's about whether the agreement is enforceable or not, it doesn't matter whether you're claiming duress, undue influence, negligent misrepresentation or whatever. It's the same theme. So if it matters, we, we would submit that isn't right, and it makes the mistake which my friend also made, which is reading exception two as if it were just a subset of exception four. But Lord Justice Robert Walker, before he set out the list of exceptions, um, <coughs> referred to the, the nature of what goes on at a mediation with more or less confident assertions of a party's case and so on and offers and counter-offers. Yes. Um, I, speaking for myself, I would have thought that it would be um, not at all exceptional for people to make innocent misrepresentations uh, in many, many mediations for the purposes of trying to settle their claims. People put their cases at their highest. If they don't know whether something's <coughs> right or not, um, they may innocently or, or even negligently misrepresent what the true position is. And is there a countervailing public policy in not exposing settlements in mediation to becoming unraveled and uh, imposing too much of a, a fetter on what people can say in the course of mediations if, for example, uh, exception two extends as far as, as you suggest it does? Lord, uh, all these questions are going to involve some form of balance, and dare I say it, go back ultimately to the, question, the, the policy questions we have and the administration of justice issues that we have. So there may be differences of view as to whether the enforceability of a settlement policy trumps, for that purpose, the uh, a fairness policy, put it a different way. Uh, now, my submission, I say it doesn't, it doesn't arise here because we're not in that situation. I understand. That. But my submission would be that there isn't a reason of principle to distinguish between the two examples you both gave. And therefore, because there's no reason of principle, the policy angle doesn't, doesn't distort the answer. Uh, if, you're on the if you entered into a settlement on the receiving end of a misrepresentation, uh, it seems to be established. Uh, I would submit that it is open to be unraveled, whether it's negligent or fraudulent, but uh, that's just my view. <laughs> I mean, uh, one has to go back to the principle. I can see that there may be an in intervening policy consideration. Um, so anyway, in this case, of course, that was an interesting excursion to see the, the, the parameters. The case is one of fraud, so to that extent, we get into that box. Uh, but second, and if it matters, and I do pick up my friend on this, on the claimant's case, the fraud which is relied upon took place during the course of the mediations. Not a situation where this is external to the mediations. It took place, if it matters, during the mediations, amongst other places, of course, because there was a continuing fraud on their case by Dr. Mubarak, all the way to the settlement agreement itself, and a continuing failure, as we saw, alleged, by the defendants to disclose what they knew. So the fraud was a continuing fraud before, after, and during the, medi the mediation. So it's not right to say this fraud somehow is disassociated from the mediation because they haven't mentioned it. It includes the conduct during the mediation. That pleading we looked at, they did not disclose in the lead up to the 2012 um, deeds. It means they did not disclose including during the mediation. So the fraud embraces the mediation period. <coughs> Third, and in response to what we friend submitted, we submit it is irrelevant that the purpose for which 
the defendants wish to make use of the documents is to resist the fraud claim rather than to make it. That is a distinction we submit without any principled difference. As soon as one gets away from the idea that uh, Unilever 2 is just a subset of Unilever 4, there is no principled reason for that difference. It is not a distinction which arises in Unilever 1. Unilever 1 is engaged whenever there is a dispute about whether there's been a concluded compromise agreement. It doesn't matter whether you're alleging there was a concluded one or you're alleging there wasn't a concluded one. Uh, it, it, the exception is engaged. It is engaged by the issue, not by the person who raises the issue uh, for those purposes. And it would lead, we submit, to an absurd conclusion, if Leonard Friend were right, that you could break without prejudice to allege fraud but not break without prejudice to resist fraud. And, and going back to my Lord, Lord Justice Popwell's point, that would make settlement agreements easier to discharge than to uphold. And make them easier to discharge than uphold than any other agreement. Because if you can only use it to set it aside, then there's an imbalance uh, against these agreements, which can't be a matter of policy. And we do submit that uh, my friend's answers to your Lordship's questions this morning exposed uh, the paucity of this submission. Uh, for example, the, the, the posit a pre-existing misrepresentation which is corrected during the mediation. The answer, I think the answer had to be in, in, in accordance with my friend's case, of course that couldn't be admitted into evidence because it isn't a matter of abuse is the answer. <coughs> That answer is one we'd say is sufficiently arresting to, to make one unravel the submission. Because if, if that is the answer, uh, then there's a real prospect of significant injustice on any such occasion. Right, so my, Lord, on that basis, we do submit that the judge was correct to conclude that this fell within exception two. Uh, it, we submit it falls an exception to on its word. If it's necessary, I think the small extension the judge mentioned was, if you like, the mirror image point, i.e. If, if you can do it to set aside, you can do it to resist a setting aside. And to that extent, if that's a small principled extension, so be it. But we say there is no principled distinction between those two situations once you realize the difference between two and four. Now, Lord, if it doesn't fit within two on the basis that, well, it, we are simply seeking to uphold rather than Reduce. And, uh, and absolutely candidly, uh, as it occurred to me when I first read the papers, it, it ought to fit within one. Uh, Lord, the, one must remember the case which is being advanced is that Mr. Mubarak had no authority for entering into <coughs> this agreement, the deed, uh, because it was a breach of fiduciary duty. And therefore, in that case, the agreement was void. They say void and avoidable, and there's avoidable case as well, but uh, they also plead it was void. So, absence of authority produced a void agreement on their case. Difficult to see how that wouldn't fit, if it doesn't get into two, why it wouldn't get into one. Because we then have a concluded compromise agreement, sorry, a, uh, the issue is whether a, the communications resulted in a concluded compromise agreement. Now, it may be that others have thought that that means nuts and bolts offer an acceptance and, and all the rest of it and consideration, maybe so. but. I didn't see authority isn't part of that as well. If there wasn't authority to enter into this agreement, then there wasn't a concluded compromise agreement. Well, that's, I mean, fair point. I, I, I mean, I'm afraid I haven't looked at Tomlin on standard telephones, but what, what actually was that case about? I, I don't know what that, we don't think we have that in the bundle. I don't know no. what it was about. It was only obviously an example as cited by... Well, it was an example, but I just, I mean, in terms of what Rob, Lord Justice Robert Walker had in mind, um, it perhaps illustrates it, and, and it's referred to in Muller, though, apparently. Um, I just, in terms of the scope of that paragraph, um, I just. Yeah. Uh -huh. 
was me I thought he I can't actually see it, but maybe some photo. But uh, oh, I see. Ah, oh, oh, sorry. Yes, I've misread this. So, well, what does Lord Justice Hoffman note in Muller's case that prompts this exception? Mentions Tompkins at page 77 at B, just above B, <coughs> firmly based yes. on analysis of the rule of underlying rationale. Yes. The trouble with that is, of course, Lord Justice Hoffman's underlying rationale hasn't been, hasn't well, hasn't survived well in the test of time. Well, I think what he's referring to is is the sort of cuts and head point there, really. Um, Is it, is it at page 78F, referring to Lord Griffiths mentioning some of the cases on which without prejudice material was admissible, e.g. if the issue is whether or not negotiations have resulted in an agreement? Oh, yes, sorry, that's... So oh, yes, I see. Maybe that. Maybe agree that it's out. If it's whether or result. Whether result in any... I think it must be agreed settlement. Um, well, yes. It is described in the most general of terms. It is. Uh, oh, right, let's so, so take a look. I see your point. Uh, there wasn't authority. There wasn't a degree of settlement. I, 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 so yeah, I no, I see, I, I see the way you put it, that, that you, the allegation being is that you knew the person sitting on the other side of the table was not, was not a duly authorised agent of... Yes. Of the person he purported to uh, represent. Yes, and that's why the case is not just avoidable but void. Yes. Yes. Right. It seemed to us that it's <laughs> almost most. So you say I, I'm not sorry. I'm, I, I don't accept you. You do act for uh, the principal, and they say, oh, "Well, that we can easily solve that. We'll 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 get the principal on the phone." Yes. The principal comes on the phone and says, "Yes, of course I authorise it." Yes, I see. <laughs> but we put that on the basis that it does appear so to that us. That may be said that that was not admissible. Well, because it occurred in the course of the mediation. Well, that would be the um, that would be the argument. Yes. Which the response would be, "Well, look at you, Lever One." <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, I follow. Do you have a respondent's notice on this? We don't have a respondent's notice on this. Uh, except that point. The, the way I put it is, I mean, if necessary, I, mean, I don't think there's any. There's no factual stuff here, but it, but it does appear to us it does fit within Unilever 2 because the mirror image point plainly works, and there's no discernible difference as to why it shouldn't work. But if, however, Lordship came to the view that, well, for some reason, it, it, Unilever 2 just works one way, not both ways, mm -hmm. then we do submit to the necessary do for the respondent's notice to say, well, hang on a minute, what's wrong with Unilever 1? On the face of it, that's the simplest answer to this case because they claim not just voidable but void. And why on earth is authority not a part of the, the elemental question whether a contract was concluded? It doesn't matter which way round you argue the point in Unilever 1, you can argue it other way. Well, it might not, though, it might not deal with the voidable inequity point. I mean, you, you know, the agent may be authorised to make the agreement. It doesn't mean the agreement isn't voidable because he's, he's getting a personal benefit from it. Yes, I think that's why they put it both ways. Yes. They put it void because agent actually lack of agent, lack of authority. Lack of authority. But what I'm meaning, your reliance on this point wouldn't be an answer to the the, the, the claim of breach of fiduciary duty and accessory liability. Well, that's why we go for you leave it too. But but the I point is, it. once it's in, it's in. <laughs> no, right. I thought. Yep. Okay. That's true. Mm -hmm. uh, now, uh, Lord. Lord some objections taken to, to that by the claimants, if I can deal with those, I hope, briefly. Uh, there's a general theme in the French skeleton that the court should be cautious in either applying or suddenly <coughs> extending the exceptions. And, and there is authority that the courts, I think it's right, that the court, please do accept that there is need for caution. Um, but it only goes so far. Um, there is much said about the need for certainty uh, and the importance for busy practitioners to know whether things will or won't become available through 
process of uh, admitting without prejudice uh, communications. Um, we are concerned with the ambit of an exception. Uh, it's unreal we submit to contend that the matters we are discussing would make any difference to the busy practitioner, uh, i.e. whether the exception applies under two, uh, depending on who, is it, who it is who wishes to use the documents. Uh, there are a number of exceptions uh, we know in Unilever. Uh, any properly informed practitioner will know that there are exceptions and will not be able to predict whether exceptions will or will not be engaged. You won't be able to predict whether there will be a dispute about whether the agreement was reached, whether there was a void or was an stop or anything else. So yes, caution is required, but the idea that your lordship should be urged to keep a very narrow focus on this question because of the importance of certainty is not, is not an answer which is realistic in this case. It, it won't matter one iota to the busy practitioner whether Unilever 2 applies on a mirror image basis or not. Um, can I just, one observation to follow that up. If you go to Mr. Justice Newey's case, um, which is bundled to tab 23, because the certainty argument is always run um, in, in response to any with any without prejudice uh, discussion. Um, and if you go to paragraph 56, I think Mr. Justice Miles says something similar to that. Paragraph 56, um, in fact, he mentions Tomlin there, interesting enough, um, although I'm not sure we get very much from it. It would be impossible to decide whether there's a consider agreement unless one looked at the correspondence. Uh, same concern in the present case. Moreover, while the party to without prejudice negotiate. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Sorry, I'm sorry paragraph 56. Tab, which one is tab it? 23. Tab 23. Yes. A paragraph 56. Uh, middle, of the, middle of the paragraph. While the party to without prejudice negotiations is entitled to assume that the negotiations will not generally be capable of being deployed in court proceedings without his consent. He could have no absolute assurance of that. On any view, the conclusive agreement exception means that he runs the risk of the correspondence becoming admissible, because his opponent alleges the negotiations resulted in an agreement. The extent of the risk arising from the exception does not seem to me to be significantly increased. It is understood as allowing not merely a party to the negotiations, but someone else with a legitimate interest in their outcome to rely upon them. Now, obviously, there's slightly different facts there, but uh, one does, uh, all, I, all I draw from that is that one has to deal with the the mission of the importance of certainty and the Im impact on the busy practitioner with some degree of care when one's talking about very small considerations around these exceptions, because in reality it makes no difference at the time. So that's, that's the first uh, response. Um, the second thing, my friend Smith, as he submitted this morning, is that the exception only works one way, and I, I've sought to, to deal with that. We say that's simply wrong and on principle. Um, and it, and it derives from a false premise that one explains exception two through exception four. Um, can I just say on two cases referred to, uh, Underwood and Cox, we would submit the court doesn't get very much guidance from that at all. Um, if you turn on to that at tab 28, As, as we read the judgments in this case, what the court was saying was it just wasn't without prejudice at all. <laughs> Not that it was, but there's an exception. Um, and you get that from uh, uh, was it Chief Justice Boyd um, at page 75. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. yes, at the end of that. Yes, paragraph of the it simply wasn't a bona fide offer of a compromise. Yes. Uh, and similarly, at, at, the end, the at the end of Mr. Justice Middleton, that, that thing, it, wasn't, it doesn't contain, it contains no offer of compromise. So, uh, what Mr. Lord Justice Walker read into it, and whatever it is, I, I don't know, but as we read that judgment, it simply wasn't without prejudice at all, so it doesn't even engage an exception. So, in any event, what we submit is, Lord Justice aren't very much guided by what happened there. Determining what we have to deal with. Um, uh, uh, the other, the other uh, judgment referred to was Finken, but of course Finken w w was uh, uh, a case under exception four, uh, and the, the little quirk in exception four 
is that the um, defendant appears to have told the truth in the mediation. So it was alleged. He didn't then deny it. He hadn't put any evidence in response. But he appears to have told the truth in the mediation. Uh, and it was said that that was an abuse of the mediation through uh, exception four. Uh, and the court determined it wasn't, because if you're in exception four, you have to abuse privilege uh, as such. Now, the court didn't actually deal with the question the law should raise, which is, if you subsequently say something that's untrue, is that an abuse? I don't know the answer to that. Uh, but it, it wasn't up for discussion on, in Finken. The question was, if he, if he told the truth in the mediation, does that break it under exception four? The answer was no. But again, one doesn't get much, the lordships don't get much assistance from that, because exception two was not discussed. Uh, and we don't put our case, we never have put our case under exception four. The last point raised by my friend was that um, uh, there's a, an, um, some form of asymmetry in the arguments that we submit um, because, uh, as put in the skeleton, I think orally, my clients chose to make the statements without prejudice and therefore ensure that they couldn't be used against them but want to be used for them. Uh, well, there's no asymmetry at all because that's the point of the exceptions we submit. The exceptions apply whoever wants to use the material. It just so happens that we want to use it in this case. It doesn't preclude the uh, claimants from using it if in a different set of facts they fell within an exception. There's absolute symmetry, and, and that's our case that there's symmetry all the way through these exceptions. Uh, what I think is the submission, or sort of underlying the submission being put, is that somehow it was, I don't know if it was tactical or abusive to say something without prejudice rather than open and therefore to get some advantage for that in the future. And maybe if that were the case, there might be some different considerations, but that's not alleged here. And as your lordships will be aware, there wasn't an issue in 2012 about these payments. It wasn't as if this was being put deliberately under without well, prejudice negotiations so that, aha, it won't be looked at in the future. No one had raised an issue about this. The dispute was about the, uh, the success fee. This was put in the mediation statements because it was, a, it was perceived to be a matter of context that by, by the defendants. But it wasn't as if this was somehow secreted in a without prejudice statement so that it could be used by them and not by the claimants. There wasn't an issue in those days to which such a scheme would have attached. It was put in without prejudice at the time. Was, no one thought there was anything, no one thought there was an issue. And the idea that somehow you should turn around and say it openly once you've said it without prejudice, well, why would you if you thought there wasn't any issue about it? If you say it to the solicitors and nothing even no one even objects to it, why on earth do you say, well, I'm going to say this openly now to make sure that I can use it in, in the future? There's no question of abuse here. It was put in without prejudice because it was never thought to be a matter in dispute. Uh, and therefore, the asymmetry argument, which I think is really a sort of abuse argument, concealed, isn't something which we say works on the facts. So well, th that's all we wish to say on Unilever 2 slash subject to respondents, respondents notice 1. Um, can I now move on to the uh, second exception found by the judge, which was the Muller exception, uh, to which, uh, my friend's right, there's some obscurity as to its ratio, although I think we can get there. Um, uh, clearly the exception does exist. It was mentioned in Lord Justice Walker's list. The list has been approved. So clearly the exception does e exist. Uh, uh, the, um, the, the complication is that Lord Justice Hoffman's reasoning has been disproved. And my friend's right, the, the, the Lord Justice Leggett and Swinton Thomas thought that the legal route to the answer was through waiver, which on the face of it, it wasn't in that case because it wasn't a two-party case. So both sets, both sets of judgments have difficulties, but the ratio we submit and, and the reason for the exception is the, the tension which arises when a party puts a matter in issue, but then seeks to resist the admissibility of documents which are needed fairly to resolve that issue. So it's, a, it's, a, it's not just relevance, of course it's not relevance. It's a double, double significance. You put it in issue, 
but you seek to withhold documents which are necessary fairly, and I'll come back to what, what I think that means, fairly to resolve that issue. Um, and one gets that, we submit, from um, the two judgments of Lord Justice Leggett and Swinton Thomas. Um, if you go to tab 7, Page 81, um, Lord Justice Swinton Thomas Perth. Um, and just uh, page 81, just a letter B. Um, they have alleged in settling their proceedings for the sum that they accepted, they acted reasonably, because the plaintiffs have brought the reasonableness of their conduct in issue. And then, as Mr. Sher rightly has submitted, the allegation would in reality not be justiciable without the court having sight of the right prejudice negotiation. So, subject to what justiciable means, one can see the two elements there. You bring it into issue, but it's an issue that needs the documents to be resolved. Uh, and similarly, Lord Justice Leggett, um, on the same page, just above letter G, having agreed with Lord Justice Hoffman, um, uh, I've reached the same conclusion on the ground of waiver. The waiver would relate to all matters relevant to the issues raised by the plaintiffs almost relevant to the issues raised by the plaintiffs. Now, interesting word, he used the word relevant there, by the way, to the issues raised by the plaintiffs. Were it not so, public policy might be used as a guise for concealing what happened in the earlier action, and that might result in double, double recovery. It would be inequitable not to order discovery. And my Lord, Lord Justice Powell was quite right. This, the court could have determined the reasonableness of the settlement agreement, merely by reference to the settlement agreement itself, which had been disclosed. That was already before the parties, before the court. I, I jotted down your ratio, your suggested ratio, rather, well, in these terms, but I, I'm not sure it was exact. A party puts a matter at issue but resists disclosure of yes. documents relating to that issue. A party puts an issue, doc, puts a matter in issue, yes, uh, which can only fairly be resolved by, by the documents, but seeks, their, seeks to resist their disclosure. <coughs> So maybe there are three parts. You put an issue. The issue can only fairly be... I'll come back to what I think the word fairly means in this context, but we can use that for a moment. Fairly be resolved by those documents, but yet seeks to resist... But that's very broad, isn't it? It's broader, I think, than what Lord Justice Swinton Thomas was referring well, to. As um, he says just below A, that different considerations apply to the present case, different considerations apply because it is the litigants who were engaged in the previous without prejudice negotiations and have themselves put their own conduct in issue. I presume that means in relation to the without prejudice negotiations. Yes. yes. Can I contrast that with this example? Supposing at this, um, at this um, mediation your clients had produced the, um, the position paper which they did with the statements about payments to Dr. Al Harvey and Becker and so on, and the reaction uh, from the claimants had been absolute horror at this revelation. They called off the mediation straight away. They issued proceedings of, of the sort we are now have. Uh, and your, your client's defense is, we had no knowledge that uh, Dr. Al Harvey owned Becker. We, we were quite ignorant of that. In those circumstances, would, uh, would um, the other side be entitled to put your position paper in evidence. Well, one has to work out whether that would fall into the exceptions. It wouldn't fall into one and two. No, but I'm wondering whether it falls in. You have put in a matter in issue, namely you didn't know something. Can that be fairly tried without deployment of your admission in the position paper? Well, that's, I'd submit that that, does, that would be the answer. Because would if be you put answer. it in issue, if you assert something which requires that material to be fairly determined, then it would in my submission, engage the exception. Because the exception is the tension. You put something to the court to determine. You know that there are documents which are, whether it's material or justiciable or fairly determined or whatever, that's a matter we can discuss. But you put an issue, but yet you don't, you're not prepared to accept the documents that are relevant to that issue. That appears, we submit one gets from Muller. Now, but do you, I mean, what, what uh, Mr. Quest said about Muller was, that, well, that's, that, I mean, really the point I've just made, that if the 
what was put in issue were the negotiations themselves. Well, so can you, can you draw a wider principle from Muller than that? Well, that's why we submit that it's not just whether you make reference to the negotiations in the pleading. You have to see what the substance of the pleading is. And that's why I began by making the submission that when they plead absence of knowledge, when they plead failure to disclose, they are actually pleading, amongst other things, absence of knowledge during the mediation, failure to disclose during the mediation, because those allegations embrace the very conduct in the mediation. You cannot deal with that issue without having regard to what happened in the mediation. So that's why I opened on that basis, and it was with an eye to I be on to the Mueller exception. Okay. That the, it's, it would be a, and this is, we'll come on to Mr. Justice Miles in a minute, the answer isn't, well, how do you artfully plead your way around this? Do you make reference to it or not? The answer is, what is the substance that is revealed by the case that you advance? Uh, and one gets this as well, we would submit, um, on a proper understanding of Muller itself. Now, uh, just two minutes on that, if I can. Uh, Sorry, can I just, uh, not sure I quite understand for your submission on what the relationship needs to be between the matter you put in issue and the without prejudice negotiations? The without prejudice negotiations need to be available. We need to be in a situation where the without prejudice negotiations are necessary for the fair determination of the issues which are raised. So, so, so it's any, issue, any issues that are raised in the proceedings? If the issues relate to or include the, without, the conduct of the without prejudice negotiations. Well, that's, well, that's what I was just saying, thank you, Dan trying to tie you down on that. If, if, if one, one could say that in many cases in which one's dealing with an, ad, ad, an admission in, without prejudice correspondence, it's relevant to the issues in the proceedings. Uh, so a personal injury claimant uh, might say in the course of negotiations, actually I accept I'm grossly um, exaggerating my injuries, but this is going to cost you a fortune to defend. Uh, so uh, why don't you... Um, pay me a decent proportion. That's, that's relevant to the issue in the proceedings. What, what I thought you were saying, because you do in relation to the facts of this case, that you, what's, what has to be put in issue is something which relates to, I think was the expression you just used now. And I wasn't quite understanding what, what the relationship must be between that which is put in issue and the negotiations themselves. Well, well, in your Lordship's example, if the parties are negotiating and there are admissions in the negotiation, then the claim isn't a claim about the negotiation at all. The claim is about whatever the claim is. Yes. So it's not necessary to resolve the claim to have regard to admissions in the, in the negotiation. It's a different, one can see, it might, it might, in a general sense, be of assistance to the court. But at that point, the court says, no, 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 that's not, the, the claim can be determined in full on the facts that reference to admissions or whatever happened in the mediation, and that's important to maintain that. The difference here is that the factual allegations which are alleged, it's not about admissions, the factual allegations which are alleged include, by necessary implication, what happened and what was said during the mediation. So one cannot determine the question of, in your logic example, one can determine the personal injury claim by reference to the facts of the personal injury claim. In my example, in this case, one cannot determine fairly the question of knowledge without having regard to knowledge acquired during the mediation. But so is it, is it that in order for the Muller exception to be engaged, the party must put in issue the content of the without prejudice negotiations or what happened during the without prejudice negotiations? It's, it's that issue that must, Lord, I, well, must, uh, must put, that, that that must put, put that in issue. S subject to the one caveat which we do submit, which it doesn't, it doesn't follow that the party has to expressly do so. It doesn't have to say, and by the way, something happened in the mediation, or something didn't happen in the mediation. If the allegation itself embraces that question, whether pleaded or not, then yes. Well, that's helpful because I think actually the, <clears throat> the, the proposition that uh, I jotted down and read back to is actually not really the submission you're making. I think that is put on an altogether broader basis. Um, uh, but I, I understand your, your point. Now, you're saying that the claimants, by necessary implication, are saying we were not told at any time 
until 2017, including during the day or whatever it was that the mediation took place, uh, that um, Dr. Al Harbi owed, owed Becker and so on, and yes. these sums had been paid. That's the way you put it. That's the way we put it. I understand. I mean, look, we, we do submit, we get, we get some support from that, or admit we get support from that, from Muller itself. And just to run through that, because the, the claimant sued for negligence in relation to a share transfer. <coughs> they had earlier settled with the shareholders. So, and they had obtained, on the judgment, a, quote, substantial amount in that settlement. So um, if you then, if you were still on tab 7, um, on page 76, uh, just to put a letter C, paragraph 17, uh, they pleaded that the settlement was in reasonable mitigation and gave credit for the sums received. Uh, the solicitors disputed the reasonableness of the mitigation uh, and that gave rise to the issue. But the point we say that's relevant here is that the action itself brought the settlement sum into issue. They couldn't honestly bring this claim without giving credit for the sums received in the settlement. So the act, whether pleaded, paragraph 17 was irrelevant, whether they expressly pleaded this was in reasonable mitigation or not, they couldn't avoid bringing into the action the conduct of the mediation because they had to give credit for the settlement. And as soon as the defendants challenged the reasonableness of that, it became a contested issue. So it didn't arise, we submit, on the, on the mere fact of a pleading point. It arose, we submit, on a matter of substance the nature of the claim necessarily required the court to determine uh, wh whether credit should be given or not. Well, I, I don't, I'm not sure that entirely answers my Lord Lord Justice Popperwell's question, but it is, we say, an illustration, or a rather obvious illustration, why that it's not a pleading game, this. The question is, does, is the issue, is the factual issue raised on the case? And we say it is here. <coughs> now, just uh, on the two examples that your Lordship has been shown, uh, EMW and Halborg uh, at bundle 2, tab 23, uh, two things, or just <coughs> running through it. The unusual feature of this case was that the WP negotiations were with what were called the Halberg claimants and the defendant architects in the, in the different action. But this action was between the solicitor agents and the solicitor. So neither of them held the privilege at all. The privilege was held by the original negotiating parties. The action was between the two lawyers who were not privilege holders. Uh, and therefore, the, the issue that the judge had to deal with was how do you get into an exception when neither of the privilege holders is making any case, is not even involved in the case? Uh, and that's why, if you, if you turn to paragraph 56, it's the first part of the judgment in paragraph 56. Uh, Mr. Justice, you said, for, for the purpose of unity for one, that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that neither party with the privilege is asserting the agreement was or wasn't made. I'm going to speak about that. Um, 56, I think just above the bit we looked at, the group of the master that concluded agreement exception applies. The Tomlin case observed that it would be impossible to decide whether there was a concluded agreement or not unless one looked at the correspondence. So that's an indication of the breadth of Unilever 1 and also why it shouldn't matter who raises the point because uh, no privilege holder raised the point in EMW came from outside. Uh, so, so far as, and that also complicated the Muller case, of course, um, the Muller bit, uh, uh, because that was the argument. If you go on to paragraph 63, um, the, the argument at 63, four lines down, the Muller decision, he said, must be confined to cases where the content of the without prejudice communications is put in issue by one of its owners. And of course, neither owner was putting it in issue here. Here, in contrast, the, the parties weren't doing that. Uh, and that's why, when we get to 64, the judge said, well, uh, in the end, justice does demand the exception. So he's actually <coughs> extending, on the face of it, or at least applying a broader sense of Muller, even in circumstances where, which neither of the privileged holders, this is, a, I think, a four-party case, not a, a three-party case. 
And he's saying that because the touchstone, as I said earlier, of justice clearly demands it, will permit it. Now, the other point that, that was mentioned, and my friend took you to it, when he went through his reasons, if you go over the page to 305, um, at Roman 3, he does make the point that Mr. Halberg, that was the party seeking to resist disclosure, himself made reference in the defense to the negotiation. But the reference he talks about is a very small reference that the, he informed EMW that the other side ascribed no value at all to EM's work. So that was the pleaded reference by the party seeking <coughs> to resist disclosure. But four was a much broader analysis we would submit. The Roman force hard to see how EMW's claim would be justiciable without disclosure of the documents. EMW and the court would both in the face of it be in the dark as to, for example, and this is so much wider than the defense we just looked at, what any payments uh, architects have made related to how they came to be made on that basis, why nothing has been paid in respect of other items of cost, and should it prove to be the case that no settlement has been paid by not. So it wasn't dependent on the resisting party's pleading. It was dependent on the fact that the case put in issue matters which could not properly be uh, determined without reference to the information. So it's an extension, uh, we would submit, or at least an application of Muller, confirming what, what, what I submitted earlier, that it's not dependent on finding an express pleading about something. It's dependent on finding an issue <coughs> as to facts which must be resolved. Uh, now, the contrast uh, with that, and maybe this is to the extent that one can see some some guidance perhaps if one goes to Briggs and Clay the, the facts of this case were a little bit complicated but just to summarise if I may the pension trustee sued Aon as administrators for negligence having mitigated their loss by settling in a previous action with the pension the employers. Um, Aon alleged the settlement was unreasonable. And the reason they said it was unreasonable, or a break in the chain of causation, was that the claimants hadn't been properly advised by the lawyers in settling it. Uh, the claimants then turned around and sued the lawyers in the alternative. The lawyers said, we want the without prejudice negotiations between the claimants and Aon uh, to show that Aon were aware of the point that they say we missed. <coughs> um, and Aon didn't raise it either. Uh, so you can see, if you go to paragraph 25, <coughs> um, the lawyers emphasize they are not seeking to rely on the without prejudice communications between them and Aon's lawyers for the truth or falsity of anything said in them or for any admission or implied admission, but only so that the trial judge can see any extent to which Aon's lawyers were involved and see as they contend that Aon were in as good a position as, as the lawyers to raise the argument, if it was a good one, that should have been raised. So the argument is, well, <coughs> you criticize us for being negligent, but you knew about this point as well, and you didn't raise it. That, that, was, that was what they wanted the information for. And ultimately, what the judge said is, well, fine. But that's wholly unnecessary for the determination of this action. Because if you go to 103, uh, as an example, the, the various heads of uh, issue that were raised, but rather obviously, as he said, the question of negligence is objective. So whether the, the, the claimant's lawyers were negligent or not will be determined on the facts of whether they were negligent or not. Perhaps in response to Lord Justice Popperwell's question, in the PI case, you determine it on the facts of the case. You don't need to know whether Aon knew about the point or didn't know about the point to determine this case fairly. And essentially all the other arguments were the same. So having gone through the analysis on the facts of that case, he said, well, this is so peripheral that we don't need to get into that. Per contra, we would say. Uh, but in, as far as the test is concerned, we do rely upon the test set out in 99 and 100, uh, which is what the judge relied upon. Um, and we submit it's, it's consistent with what I submitted earlier. Um, now, 
there is a question, as he uses the word non-justiciable, uh, <coughs> and clearly lordships have, have uh, had a conversation or discussion of what that means, and maybe it doesn't mean what it, what, what it looks as if it ought to mean. Um, uh, we would submit, in a sense, that the words don't matter whether it's justiciable or fairly justiciable. Or can or fairly be tried. Can fairly be tried. Exactly. That really is the essence. That is the essence. Uh, Learned Friends' submission is it's all about necessity. Can the court reach a conclusion? It can't do that. The court can reach a conclusion of anything. But it's can the court reach a fair conclusion in a very, very broad sense. And as Lordship pointed out this morning in Muller, they could reach the conclusion based on the settlement agreement. But they needed more because Lord Justice Negate, like I said, the court may not, give, may not be able to reach a proper conclusion. So we would submit, don't, it's not necessary to get too uh, fastidious about that precise word used, but whether in the interest of justice, once a party introduces the issue, that's the, the critical gateway, if you like, but once the party introduces an issue, whether it can be determined fairly is going to be the touchstone, however one expresses that. Um, now, can I um, also refer to the, the third case, Mr. Justice Miles's case, at page 27. <coughs> um, uh, so I'm curious, he, he did apply Muller for some of the case, but then I think Overter, he said it wouldn't apply for a different part of the case, whether the, the contention that the claim was brought for improper purpose. Um, he only gave brief observations, as we see. Where he ended up, um, uh, at, at 60, and leaving aside what he said about uh, Mr. Justice Roth, um, exception must, I see, be confined to cases where the resisting party has directly put the contents of the prejudice negotiations in issue in the proceedings, and there is a real risk the case cannot be fairly determined, again, I don't quibble with that bit of it, without admission of the without prejudice evidence. What would you say on a face that that's what Mr. Justice Roth? Did. And that's, I mean, on its face, I'm content with that test because we do say that the claimants has, have put the contents of that prejudice negotiations in issue in the proceedings, the reasons I submitted earlier. Mm. Now, it's possible that what Mr. Justice Miles meant when he said that was there has to be an express pleading about it. If that's what he meant, then we, we would submit that he was wrong, because that's just a pleading game rather than a substantive game. Um, as to the two cases he referred to in paragraph 59, Unilever, first of all, neither case involved the Muller exception. So in neither case was it argued that there was or wasn't an exception in, in, in other Unilever or of a Louis. In Unilever, the defendants hadn't put anything in issue. It was purely a claim by the claimants about um, the patent infringement. So the defendants hadn't put anything in issue, so the rule well, simply didn't arise. Uh, of a Louis, of a Louis, a little bit more complicated, the, uh, it was a claim for possession. The defendants alleged adverse possession, and the, cla and the claimants sought to rely upon section 29 of the Limitation Act based on an acknowledgement of title in the meantime. So uh, it wasn't explored whether by, by pleading adverse possession, the claimants, the defendants had put an issue, the limitation defense, which the claimants subsequently ad advanced. Uh, and I can quite see it may well not have been, but it's more complicated than such. In any event, that wasn't a matter for discussion. Muller wasn't, wasn't uh, uh, was cited, but it wasn't part of the case. It wasn't alleged that that exception. So, with respect to Mr. Justice Miles, 59, two examples he gave certainly don't justify a conclusion. If that were his conclusion, one has to plead a case expressly. Uh, but what we do say also about Mr. Justice Miles is he, with respect, uh, misconstrued what Mr. Justice Roth, uh, where Mr. Justice Roth ended up. Because Mr. Justice Roth didn't end up just in a test of centrality or relevance. 
he followed expressly uh, Mr. Justice Fancourt. Uh, and where he ended up, we say correctly ended up, is at paragraph 86. Paragraph 86, and this echoes, we submit, what I submitted at the outset. A fundamental issue in the trial will therefore be whether the defendants, as, as, as the claimants claim assert, acted dishonestly and therefore whether the claimants were indeed unaware of these key facts before 2017 and more particularly before entering into the 2012 deed of settlement. So that's the point I've been, been banging on about. That's the issue which is raised. <coughs> Since the claimants rely strongly on their lack of knowledge, I consider this is an issue, and indeed a potentially critical issue, raised by the claimants, absolutely. Uh, sorry, raised by the way the claimants have advanced their case. In my judgment, this issue is not fairly justiciable. The defendants cannot put in evidence what the first defendant told the claimant at mediation scheme. So it's the two elements. They raise the issue. It can't probably be determined without the evidence. And Mr. Justice Miles said, well, the second bit, you're making a sort of evidential evaluation, and to some extent, there has to be an evidential evaluation. I'm not sure how a trial judge can do otherwise. But the critical door opening exercise, as the judge found, was the claimants had put this in issue. So, sorry, I think you may have said this, but I mean, you are saying really that that your your case does fit within what Mr. Justice Miles says in paragraph sixty. Well, <laughs> but, but you, I mean, by necessary implication. Well, the way. <laughs> Because As I you would them. say, they say, it was never said to us at any time, including during the mediation, that, that this was the position. Yes. We say, we, well, put it this way, I say we fit within the way I interpret Mr. Justice Miles' paragraph 60 on its face. If what he means is... Yeah, has your, to be your point was, he, if he means it has to be expressly put in the pleadings, well, that's too narrow. Yes. Yes. But, it, but otherwise... We say we do fit within that test, yes, which is right. essentially we say what Mr. Justice Ross decided, which is what Mr. Justice Van Court decided. I wonder whether that might be a moment we can give a rest to the transcribers, which I think they might well welcome. So we'll rise for five minutes. Oh, yes. All right.
rise. Two final points in Muller. First is that um, if you still have the judgment that uh, we've just been looking at, I, I took you to 86 and 87 just to point out also 80, 88 3, uh, the judge was concerned, uh, echoing the submissions I made earlier. Sorry, where are we? Where in sorry, page 105 of the bundle. Of? Uh, of the core bundle. Yes, sorry, right, yes, sorry. Tab yeah. 7, uh, paragraph 88 3. judge was concerned, we submit, rightly concerned, that if the material is not submitted to the court, the trial will be misled. Um, and because of the way that the case has been pleaded, uh, we echo that concern. And the judge concluded that may not alone be sufficient to justify it, we regard it as a relevant fact, and we submit it as a relevant, very relevant fact. Uh, the last point, Lord, uh, is uh, that's a slightly cheeky point, I think, raised by my friend uh, towards the end of his submissions, which is that the, the way to interpret, as I understood it, the way to interpret Muller is that it's a special workaround exception in a three-party case. Um, in a two-party case, you don't need the special Muller exception. You just need waiver. Uh, waiver hasn't been pleaded, and therefore, they hasn't been alleged, and therefore, um, haha, uh, it can't be uh, advanced. Uh, Lord, I don't find anything, I mean, I'm not entirely sure what that is. I think the submission may be eventually that there's another exception. I'm not sure how it's being put. That Muller is an exception for three party cases, and there's a different in Unilever 7 exception applying for waiver. I think that might be what it's being alleged. I don't know exactly. Um, but there's nothing in the appellant's notice about that. There's been no suggestion that waiver as a separate category of exception must be, uh, must be alleged. But the reality is, we submit, is that in, in Muller yes, itself. Uh, you hardly Lord Justice Robert Walker would hardly need to, to have stated that privilege doesn't survive waiver, whether you describe that as an exception or not. Um, well, most of it, but there's nothing in the, in the appellant's notice that that's, a, that's an issue. The reality is, we submit, Muller applies as much to a two-party case as a three-party case. The, the judges explained in Muller, or they offered the root of waiver, but the substantive issue is the issue we've been discussing, and it doesn't one doesn't cut out the issue if it's a two-party versus a three-party case. It's simply the exception, and we rely upon that exception. And whether the ultimate legal route comes through waiver or through some special application of, of, of Muller, we submit it doesn't matter, because uh, as before, Mr Justice Roth, we relied on exception six. He identified exception six applied on the fact pattern that we submitted. Uh, we submit the fact pattern still applies here. Whether the route by which one gets to that conclusion is then waiver or not, we submit it doesn't matter because what matters is the exception is engaged. So sorry, are you, are you saying you do want us to find, if necessary, that there's been a waiver? Well, uh, we, we would submit that the way to analyse the uh, Muller is that this is an independent exception. The judges, the, the two Lord Justices there, considered waiver was the legal route to the outcome but of course, that didn't apply, in fact, in Muller, because it was a three-party case to which waiver couldn't have arisen. So we submit waiver is actually nothing really to do with it. The answer is this is an independent exception. If Muller is engaged on its terms, the without prejudice privilege is broken. One doesn't need to worry about waiver or whatever other regime you get to, because it's an independent exception, whatever the, the two-party or three-party situation. The waiver analysis is a bit of a red herring was raised by those clearly very eminent judges. But on further reflection, waiver doesn't get them where they thought it got them. The waiver, probably like Lord Justice Hoffman's analysis in Muller, isn't, isn't, we would submit, the present way to approach Muller. It is instead what, what has come out of the cases we've been looking at and the justiciable issue instead. So we would submit waiver doesn't come into it because waiver didn't come into it in Muller. Uh, and waiver was, with respect, wrongly thought of as the root in, in, in Muller. So it would be a curious conclusion to say, well, in a two-party case, some other situation is going to arise which, which wasn't Muller and hasn't yet been identified. So we, we submit waiver isn't an answer 
certainly my friend's point isn't a good one. Um, and we're content to rest on Unilever 6 as the exception the judge found. Whether your lordships conclude that because of that, the legal route is waiver, I'm not. I mean, I'm completely ambivalent. It's, it, the important thing is that the exception applies, and therefore the exception breaks the without prejudice privilege. Um, and that, in my submission, is enough without having to worry about that extra step of waiver. Well, I understand you, you say that uh, Muller applies, and therefore it's the Muller exception. But what, what I was really inquiring is um, if the true explanation for Muller, which was a three-party case, is that you need to get around the problem of waiver, because it's a three-party case, and you do it in those circumstances by saying what matters is putting something in issue. Uh, and if, therefore, that rationale is restricted to a three-party case where that's necessary, and in a two-party case, Muller itself doesn't apply, but you've got the equivalent, which is waiver, which will do the trick. If that were the right explanation, are you inviting us to say that what's happened in this case is waiver? Is well, it yeah, open yeah, to you to do if, so? If, Sorry, if, is it open to you to do so without uh, having identified that as a basis before? Well, Lord, if you put it that way, and that's where the court came to, I'd submit, then yes, if the fact pattern, if it's the same fact pattern, and the only question is, which is the legal route by which one gets to the answer? And it's either an independent exception, as in Muller, or it's a waiver answer, but based on the same fact pattern. Um, my submission is that it's the fact pattern that matters rather than the, the final route. Now, we have put it on, on the basis of Muller, and therefore Unilever 6 date. But I say, I wasn't aware of any case against me that there was some other exception 7 that I hadn't flagged before. Well, there, there, is, a, there is an important <coughs> distinction, in, in principle anyway, between an exception to what is privileged and a waiver of privilege, because a waiver involves a waiver of associated material. And that, as we know, in practice, can be quite a difficult quite a difficult issue. So that um, one might, might have to be a little bit careful about whether one treats the same fact pattern well, as waiver or as an exception. Well, the answer may be this, that uh, wa waiver may or may not arise on the facts of any individual case. There may or may not be a waiver. Waiver, in a sense, is its own little world. And as your lordship said, it's got its own <coughs> Difficulties. But the fact that there is such a thing as waiver doesn't mean that one has to restrict Muller to a three party case. Muller talks about the conditions that we identified as giving rise to a reason to break the privilege. Now, the fact that there's maybe another reason to break the privilege, a waiver, doesn't mean that one has to restrict Muller to a non waiver situation. And it's a bit of a red herring that the, the judges there talked about waiver, and it wasn't really apposite. But we do submit that if the fact pattern, which I've put up as my submissions, works, then there's no difference in principle between a two-party and a three-party case. The party who's seeking to resist the introduction <coughs> of documents is still putting in issue the same matters, the same issues of justiciability arise. Now, the right analysis may well be that in a two-party case, there's something else as well you can look into. Maybe, maybe waiver's a, a new point to think about as well. But that doesn't mean that somehow you cut down Muller simply because there's another route of waiver. Particularly if the waiver route has different connotations, there's no reason to merge the two, which is, I think, Muller and Friend's submission. So I think in response to Lordship's questions, I, I do submit that the premise of Muller and Friend's submission is that because there's waiver, therefore, Muller is restricted to a three-party situation is wrong because the fact pattern applies regardless. There's no distinction in principle. The existence of a waiver route may or may not be right, but it doesn't cut down Muller's uh, Unilever 6. Having said all that, if your lordship did push me and your lordship did say, well, this point is open to Muller and Friend, not having been in his appellant's notice, then I would say that if necessary, then we would say there's a waiver and the consequences will be the consequences. 
the, the waiver would arise in, circum in exactly the same circumstances we've looked at, where this party put these matters in issue. But it's not my it's not my case, and it wasn't my case when I came here this morning because I wasn't aware that that was going to be the case I had to meet. Um, but we do submit the premise is wrong. That the existence of a different route doesn't mean one cuts to turn this route. Well, I forget. Was there any discussion of waiver in front of the judge below? Does he deal with that in his judgment? I don't. Uh, I don't remember that no. from the judgment. Uh, it may have been an acknowledgement. There's certainly an acknowledgement in the skeleton that uh, the waiver analysis in Muller doesn't work because it's a three-party case. I think everyone accepts that. But I, I don't think it was before the judge. No. And so we, we said we didn't rely on waiver as separate from unity of the state. Because Muller is, is, as my Lord has said, really more restrictive than waiver, I think, because just look. I mean, just looking at the way Mr. Justice Miles put it, and I, I, I know you take issue with, with part of what he says, but he says it's confined to cases where the resisting party has directly, well, that's a primitive mm. argument, put the contents of the without prejudice negotiations in issue, and there is a real risk that the now, if you pause there, that would be that would be enough for waiver by the party who has put it in issue, and that would entitle the other party. To, to put in evidence anything that occurred during the uh, without prejudice discussions. But uh, Mr. Justice Miles consistently, I think Mr. Justice Roth goes on, and there is a real risk that the case cannot be fairly determined without admission of the without prejudice evidence. So that's a restricting um, quality or characteristic, So which differentiates it from waiver. So it restricts what you can put in. Well, I see that. Now, whether, whether that is, you need that restriction because it's a three-party case, not a two-party case, that, that's yeah. the point. But anyway, we've, we, I, I think we've heard your submissions on this. Uh, well, thank you. Um, can I um, now move on to the respondent's notice? Yes. Uh, and the, uh, the first... The first aspect is the third Unilever exception, which is estoppel. Uh, and uh, what that, we haven't looked at that, so if your Lordship wants to pick it up. Bundle one, authorities bundle one. Oh, four is bundle one. Yep. Okay. Tab ten. Uh, page two four four four. Yep. Much thumb, I'm sure, by now. Um, number three. Yes. Um, even if no concluded compromise, a clear statement which is made by one party to negotiations, which the other party is intended to act and doesn't fact act, may be admissible as giving me rise to an estoppel. I don't have time to turn to it, but Ocean Bulk also supported an estoppel uh, in addition to the factual matrix argument there was reliance upon an estoppel which was also found by the uh, Supreme Court and it is our case that we do plead a variety of estoppels my friend took you to them this morning uh, including estoppel by representation by acquiescence and by convention and in very broad terms following the presentation of the Becker information if I can call it that that no objection was taken to it by the claimants nothing was said about it and instead the parties agreed to uh, proceed to agreed deeds and the claimants went on to make payments under the deeds when any reasonable person as we allege would assume that the claimants acting honestly would have mentioned that this was a massive fraud which is really the nuts of the case um, so we say there's a clear construction as a matter of pleading of an estoppel case and the judge at paragraph 57 of his judgment proceeded on the assumption that if the material admitted was admitted, the estoppel could be established, which was, we say, the right assumption for that purpose. So it's a coherently pleaded estoppel case, and the judge correctly proceeded on the basis that it was available if the documents were available. Uh, if you go, please, to the judgment. Uh, 
in Gimbal Bundle. <coughs> Gimbal Bundle at, at seven, tab seven, paragraph sixty-two. judge thought the exception didn't apply in this case. And the first reason, I've gone to the end, but in first and, first and logical sequence, reasons why he said it didn't apply was that it wasn't a case of express representation. It was essentially a case of silence or convention, that such silence is very far cry from a clear and unambiguous statement to which Mr. New, Justice Newberger, which I'll go on to in a minute, referred. So the first uh, reason why the judge said there was no estoppel exception in this case was essentially an estoppel by convention or by silence doesn't count because it's not a clear and unambiguous statement giving rise to the exception. We submit that that is not a, a distinction of principle uh, because an express representation is merely one evidential route to create an estoppel. Uh, it's not a separate category of estoppel as such or a matter of principle, but there are of course a number of routes by which one can create an estoppel and they're often difficult to distinguish evidentially. I won't take you to Ross Broker at tab 20, but it, that was a case in which there was a, there was a claim for estoppel by convention, estoppel by silence, by acquiescence. And some of the Court of Appeals thought it was convention. Some of the Mr. Justice, Lord Justice Ricks thought it was representation by silence. There are whole, as you all should, but a whole species of different forms of estoppel, all of which count, but are simply different forms of, of establishing the, the outcome. Uh, and we submit that, that that is the case here. Uh, the uh, if there is an estoppel, and if the judge, as he correctly assumed, the estoppel could be established, it's not an answer to say that the particular type of estoppel is one by silence or acquiescence, as opposed to express statement. Uh, it's not a distinction of, of principle. Um, uh, and there is a, an analogy here, we say, with unilateral rectification, because we know from uh, Ocean Bark that rectification is a reason to, ex to, to break the, without prejudice privilege. But of course, a unilateral rectification case can be very similar in concept to an estoppel case, where one party uh, acts under a mistake of fact, the other party is aware of that mistake of fact and doesn't reveal his knowledge to the mistaken party. Uh, so it's a, one can establish a unilateral rectification case by, by evidence of what passed between the parties and by the conclusion of silence coming back, essentially. We would submit that's very similar in concept to an estoppel by silence, where again, the, the case is that one party said something, the other party expected, so, and that party expected that had, that had what was said been so obviously untrue, something would come back. Is, a, is there any authority that unilateral rectification is within the rectification um, category in this context? I, I say that because it's a matter of analysis. I mean, I think a lot of scholars would not really accept their, they belong together in, their very in many respects, they're very different doctrines. Maud, I think you will just pick me up there. I, I was just taking it from Oceanbark, which simply referred to rectification generally, it didn't spe specify the two well, different... that's rather what I thought. I wondered whether, I mean, the answer might be that the rather special subspecies of unilateral rectification, so to speak, belongs with the sovel, and it, one can't argue from the rectification. <laughs> Maybe you can't use it as a stepping stone. <laughs> Maybe that is a real bootstrap. But in any event, we say that the concept is the same, that the, that the whether it's by express statement or by silence when an express statement is expected, the nature of the beast is the same. It's just a matter of evidential root. And so when the judge said, well, you don't have an express statement, therefore you can't bring in yourself into this exception, we submit it wasn't a distinction. So, well, what she was doing was to apply the express, the express words of Lord Justice Robert Walker. Well, w where they came from, as we will see in a minute, is uh, Mr. Justice Newberg. Well, indeed, uh, as Lord Justice Robert Walker says. Yes. But, um, and if, if you turn, please, maybe now to, yeah. to that judgment, uh, which is at bundle, Authorities Bundle 1, Tab 8. Hodgkinson and Corby. And um, page 191. Um, uh, page 91. 
um, the, the, the first whole paragraph. What we submit, read this a minute, what we submit is that what this Justice Newberger was doing was simply setting out the elements of estoppel. He wasn't, he wasn't setting out the elements of some sort of super estoppel that breaks without prejudice privilege. No one's ever suggested that. He was simply setting out the elements of estoppel. Um, and there is, to my mind, a powerful argument for saying that a clear and unambiguous statement. So where are we? Um, sorry, it's the oh, first. The first. Sorry, yeah, yeah, first main paragraph. Yeah. A clear and unambiguous statement. Now, just pausing there. I'm so sorry, I've, I've lost the page. Which sorry. page? Which page? Are we 191. On? Thank you. A powerful argument for saying that if a clear and unambiguous statement is made by one party without prejudice correspondence, and the statement is acted on and reasonably acted on by the other party. Objection by the first party to the correspondence being put in evidence in order to justify the step taken by the second party would be plainly unconscionable, would be not be upheld by the court. Uh, reference to, oh, there we are, Tomlin again, yes. that Fred's correspondence can be looked at by the court to see if the negotiation contained result in it, resulted in a settlement. Although, of course, contract and estoppel are quite separate concepts, it appears to me logical and consistent that if without prejudice correspondence can be looked at to see if it gives rise to a contract, then such correspondence can also be looked at to see if it gives rise to an estoppel. I do not suggest there was an absolute rule to that effect. So what we would submit from that is he, was, he wasn't laying down any special extra estoppel in play. He was simply saying the rules of estoppel may give rise to the exception. Well, but he has put it in the context of a clear and unambiguous statement. Well, of course. And I think the point about that is that it's, it, it, it limits the, the evidence which is needs to be disclosed. It limits the extent to which you need go into the without prejudice well, uh, negotiations rather than saying, well, I, I said this, he didn't say anything, you know, toing and froing. Um, I mean, why, why else is Mr. Justice Newberger uh, focusing on that? Well, it's, not, it's got to be a statement, it's got to be clear, and it's got to be unambiguous. So it's quite... Uh, Quite a restricted category. Well, we would submit that what he was simply doing was reflecting the normal headline rule for estoppel, because normally an estoppel has to be a clear and unambiguous statement. Now, one, how one gets there is uh, requires a different analysis depending on the different situation. Maybe I should, maybe I ought to go just briefly to Ross Broker, which is tab twenty. I think what point I'm making is I think Mr. Justice Newberger, we can take it, was well aware of the different categories of estoppel and the basis on which an estoppel will arise. And what is striking about the passage is that he's focused on one of them. Well, at the end of the passage, he's focused on... Well, makes yes, it more but you have to read the paragraph as a whole. And I, I think it'd be surprising if, just by the use of the word estoppel at the end, he was intending to you know, broaden, broaden the scope of the paragraph. It's not how I read it. But still, paragraph uh, well, tab twenty. You want to? Well, uh, I mean, it may, may not be necessary. I mean, you know, only to make the point that in that case, the different types of estoppel yes. were considered. Essentially, the conclusion was well, it's very difficult to distinguish between them. One judge thought it was a statement. One judge thought it was convention. One judge thought it was acquiescence. There were different analyses of the same conduct, and certainly Lord Justice Ricks considered that a silence case was a case of estoppel by representation. So, well, I can understand how that could be so. But uh, anyway, there we are. But that, well, look, yes. that, that is, we say. I, mean, I think what you would have to persuade us is that that the um, that what Mr. Justice Newberger was saying there, which the importance of which is it's been taken up by Lord Justice Robert Walker in this court and stated in the way he does, which has then been approved twice, I think, by the Supreme Court or the House of Lords, is to be extended to a much broad, to the whole field of estoppels. Uh, Lord, yes, I, I think that that's, that's really we what would you have to do. That there's no distinction of principle, going back to yeah. the test of yeah. Clark, between the different routes by which the estoppel, the estoppel is established. Th those are simply the evidential means by which the legal outcome is arrived at. Now, that's a matter of legal analysis. There's no distinction in principle between an estoppel by express statement and an estoppel by silence if such a statement is required, or estoppel by convention in circumstances. Now, I accept, and, and this may be where the point goes, that one then has to transplant that analysis into the without, without prejudice sphere and say, well, even if it's right, I'm assuming it is right, I said it, 
that there's no conceptual difference between the different evidential routes by which you can arrive at an estoppel. Is it right, for the purpose of without prejudice privilege, to draw the line at one yeah. and say it's only for express statements? Yeah. Now, on that, I submit, Mr. Justice Newberger didn't have to make that decision. Uh, he wasn't, he, for the purpose of his case, he didn't have to, 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 to determine that. We say he didn't. But there's no reason in principle to draw that distinction. I can quite see that it would make it simpler if one does draw that distinction and say, well, evidentially, you can only look at things actually said as opposed to things which weren't said. But I do submit that that would be a dangerous distinction to draw because it doesn't have any real substantive effect to it. Uh, and if a party is legally entitled to an estoppel as much from silence as from statement, we would submit that that ought not to draw a difference but without prejudice rules. It simply makes it easier to operate, but without, we would submit, a, a distinction of principles. I think that's all the way I can Sorry to hold you up. But does, does the fact that something is said, let's take an express representation, does the fact that it was said during the course of without prejudice negotiations affect the question as to whether it would be unconscionable to allow the party to resolve from what was said? And might that, if so, might unconscionability differ according to the types of estoppel that one is looking at? Well, it, it might do. It might do on the facts of any individual case. And that would be worked out through the action. But I, I don't think it's a one-size-fits-all answer, with respect. It may or may not. The, the context in which things were said or not said will be relevant. And I can see that it may be an argument it wasn't unconscionable in the circumstances because the context of the mediation. But that may depend on what was said and what wasn't said. One well, must remember these cases. This is an enormous fraud that's being alleged. I it was there in black and white. You, you say wh wh wherever that line may be drawn, it would be unconscionable in this case. Yeah, how not? I mean, if they now come to court, well, we've been defrauded for fifty million pounds. I understand that. I'm just exploring. My clients, my clients say, why not? Most, you think? Um, I think, with a maybe with the exception of the stop by convention, I think you're always going to have to show that it's inequitable or unconscionable to go back on the. I mean, that's why you're stopped. Yes. Mm. I'm not sure about a stop by convention, but in a sense, it's there too because the common assumption is X and it's inequitable. Yes. Really, to go back. So I think the my, my not, point you'll not. always have to, and, and of, of course the fact it's a, a mediation might affect that. But I, I don't. Anyway, there we are. I mean, one of the slight difficulties that if um, uh, if um, Mr. Justice Newberger had expressed himself in much broader terms, as you put forward, we don't know whether Lord Justice Robert Walker would have endorsed it. No, no. But I, but I do submit that the that the. Um, you know, those have, have my solution. But what he anyway, was doing was giving you. a short-term rule of estoppel, yes. rather than giving a mm. definitive uh, lack uh, of a rule. one category of estoppel. Yes, no, yes. yes I and, and of course, what I'm the, the estoppel we're concerned about, the, the information was stated in the mediation, like the information coming from us, and the silence was coming back in the mediation. That Mr. Justice Roth's other point was it wasn't an estoppel arising out of the mediation, but we would submit clearly it was, because both the positive statement from us, and we would submit the silence coming back, was all within the mediation. So, Lord, you have my submission on that, yes. but I'm not sure I take much on that. Thank you. Lord, Lord the last um, uh, respondent's notice point, and I can deal with this, I hope, briefly, is the independent fact exception. Uh, the independent fact exception uh, was identified by Lord Griffiths in, in Russian Tompkins as existing. Uh, I'll, be, I'll be very brief with this because I've got time. Yes. Uh, as existing. Um, uh, related to independent facts in no way connected with the merits of the case under discussion. Um, uh, there is a suggestion from the uh, claimant that the exception doesn't exist, but clearly it does exist to some extent. We accept it ought to be narrowly confined. Uh, the judge concluded, he, he was, in a sense, he was, he, he, I'm not sure he came up with it, but he was the one who said it in his judgment, that uh, as far as he was concerned, the first, at least the first statements in the position paper were independent facts unconnected with it nature of the dispute. And indeed, it was their claimant's own response that was all irrelevant to the dispute. So on the face of it, on the judge's findings of fact, or the judge's assessment of, of what was said, those were facts that we were concerned with, which were unrelated to the matter on dispute. The dispute, of course, was for the £75 million success fee. The Becker payments didn't form any part of that. 
So uh, it, as the judge found, it was separate from the dispute. It was a fact, not an admission. And therefore, it falls within the exception as narrowly defined. The judge's conclusion was, well, it falls within the exception, but because I think the case hadn't been put that way, he wasn't going to find it. But we would submit that his analysis on that was, was actually spot on because it was available. We would only say the same applies to the second position paper too, but the first position paper would be, would be enough for our purposes because particularly because it was responded to by the claimants, if you like, not responded to because they didn't deal with it at all, reflecting the fact that it didn't matter for the purpose of the negotiation. Therefore, we do fit within even a narrow category there. What, what um, um, when we talk about the merits of the dispute, where, where can I find an easy uh, definition of what the dispute that went to mediation was? My Lord, well, let me have a go at that. I think the... Uh, I would hope that it's somewhere very neatly summarised in the first position paper. Well, it, the, the, the judge guilty of paragraph 15. Paragraph 15. Well, in fact, paragraphs 14 and 15. Yes. Okay. Expresses it in quite broad terms, really, doesn't it? A dispute had developed on Lancer's demand from the claimants of payments in respect of the capital performance bonus payments pursuant to the side letter. So, if that, if you define the dispute in that way, it was a contractual dispute uh, on the basis of a term of the side letter, by which there was, I think, it was a ten percent performance bonus, if you like, on the capital increases. So, it, it, the dispute was a matter of contractual construction. As to whether or not. Well, I don't see that in paragraph 14 of the judgment. Uh, what I'm looking for is a more precise definition of the issue. Well, I'm going to just. I suppose maybe 15 does identify the key issues. Sorry, then maybe I hadn't focused on it. Sorry, I'm interrupting you. But the key issues for the mediation being the proper interpretation of the provision. Yes, I see what I, Yes, okay, I, I, I see it there. I hadn't Lord, properly read on. I well, think. that may come from, uh, just to have it clear, in our position paper, which is tab, bundle two, tab, I think, six, 16, uh, 15, page 216. Tab, tab two. Tab 15, Sorry. bundle, uh, supplementary bundle, yep. tab 15, yep. uh, page 216. Um, paragraph 38, the key issues. And they, those are, that's what's there stated. Okay, well, that, that does explain it. Yes. yes, thank you. I suppose I not have that. Yeah, well, okay, a bit mystified, more. <laughs> no, I'm just looking on, for, it's paragraph 38 and following, and it's the passages after paragraph 38 that really yeah, spell out the, and, and it's spell out the issues. Yes. So, so paragraph 38 yes. reflects what's in paragraph 15 of the judgment. Yes. Following paragraphs in the position paper spell out what, what those issues are meant to. Sorry, I didn't mean to look perplexed. I was <laughs> curious. <laughs> All right. Um, yes. Well, those are my submissions. Any questions? Any questions? Thank you very much, Mr. Bertram. Yes, just a question. Um, my Lord, I'll, I'll try and arrange my reply in order of exceptions. Um, if I could just start with the reference to exception one, uh, that was belatedly raised. Um, we, we, I do have to say that that can't be open to the uh, respondents. There's no respondents notice on the point. And exception one wasn't argued or considered um, below by the judge. Uh, the first time it's been suggested um, that it's something that the respondents are relying on was in the course of Mr. Beltrami's argument. Um, we don't have the relevant authorities, although we did, I think, see a, a very brief summary of, of Tomlin in, uh, in Hodgkinson, uh, where I think one can see that the, um, the genesis of that was whether letters exchanged in, 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 on the gap rate basis could be looked at to form an agreement. Um, so, uh, well, to the extent that one, one is open to the respondents to raise a point, uh, we, we would say that the, the, 
purpose of that exception is very much about trying to establish what terms have been agreed. Uh, and of course, when one looks at ocean bulk, which is either an extension of or, or a variation on that exception, however one, one look, wants to look at it, uh, that is the principle that is being extended. In other words, the court is, is looking at um, what's the parties, the, the terms, what the parties have agreed, uh, and whether they've reached agreement. An exception one uh, has no application in my submission to a case um, where, where there's no question, obviously, that an agreement was signed in this case and what the terms of the agreement were, it was signed by Dr. Al Barbi. Um, the question is about um, whether it was executed in breach of fiduciary duty. And, and, and if. Um, well, that's in breach of fiduciary duty. What about in the, the agent lacked authority? Well, but that, that is on the basis that the agent. Uh, there's no question that he had formal authority. I see. He held the power of attorney. I see. And he signed it uh, with a, an, an, as it were, an express authority from the company. There's no doubt about that. Right. The criticism is that he uh, he lacked authority because he was acting in fraud of the company. And, and, and uh, applying the principle that an agent can never have actual authority to do something that's in fraud of his principle. It, 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 yes, it's, not, it's not about his form of policy. It's about uh, his uh, executing the agreement in breach of his duty. Yes. And that's the basis on which we say the agreement doesn't bind the companies because, because we say that's the way that. Yes, what about my example that I gave, I think, to Mr. Beltrami, where, yes. where one party says, I don't accept you're the agent of the other side. I'm, I'm not going to carry on with this meeting. On that basis, so the agent says, "Well, that, that's easily solved. I'll, I'll get my principal on the phone." The principal comes on the phone, says, "Oh yes, it's my agent." Yes. The, the mediation continues. The agreement is signed at the end, and then subsequently, the uh, the absent principal says, "The agent was never authorised. It's not binding on me." That, that's obviously a, a rather different sort of example. Yes, but I, I, what th 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 that I can see could potentially come within one because it might be said that what the principal was then saying formed part, as it were, of the of the, of the offer and acceptance yes. matrix. So, so but that, that's exception one. Well, we, we say it's not open to them, but any, anyway, it doesn't uh, uh, apply. Uh, turning to exception two, um, it, it was said by um, by my learned friend that I, I had in my argument effectively merged exception two with exception four, or, or sought to explain it as being a, a subset or variation of exception four. Well, well that, that's, that's not my position. Um, our position is, is quite simply that, that exception two is to be looked at in its own terms. That there may be cases which, as it were, give rise to an overlap uh, between exception two and exception four. Um, but exception two is to be looked at uh, in its own uh, terms and is, and is to be applied uh, if, if a assembly met, in other words, if a party is seeking to set aside an agreement obtained by uh, misrepresentation, etc., in the negotiation. Uh, and, and when one looks at the, the, the policy or principle behind that, um, I think my Lord, uh, Lord Justice Richards uh, said um, one can perhaps identify a common thread between points one and two, in that they all go to, in one way or another, existence, interpretation, and enforceability of agreements. Um, and, and, uh, but, but if I may just respectfully di uh, disagree or qualify that in, in, in one respect, because um, in, in our submission, exception two is concerned with enforceability of, of the uh, agreement, but with enforceability in a particular uh, respect. In other words, in circumstances where a party is seeking to set it aside because of uh, something said or done at the mediation. Um, and it is not concerned, or is not engaged, uh, simply because an issue about the enforceability of the agreement has been raised. No, I, perhaps, <clears throat> um, the, I, I, th I think what I was suggesting was that the, the overarching principle is, is the one I mentioned. Yes. Yeah. You say existence, um, terms, yeah. construction, enforceability, yeah. of which exceptions one and two, and ratif uh, rectification, and ocean bulk yes. are all instances. They, they are, but wh where, where, I, where uh, uh, so in my submission I was limited is that uh, the, those exceptions, particularly exception two, 
are not engaged simply because there is an issue about the enforceability of the, the agreement. Exception two is engaged, as well, just as Robert Walker said, when a party is seeking to set aside the agreement because yes. of the misrepresentation at yes. the, okay. at the, at the and that, that, and that uh, in my submission, is an important distinction, and it feeds in also from a set of point that my Lord just often well made about on, on the innocent versus uh, fraudulent misrepresentation. Um, the, 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 the principle that, that underlies um, uh, exception two, as, as I, as I uh, developed this morning, is that it's, uh, the touchstone there is whether there's an abuse of the occasion of the um, without prejudice negotiations. Uh, I, 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 and that, I mean, if we're, when we're trying to um, resolve the, the, the potential conflict that, um, between innocent misrepresentations and uh, fraudulent ones, that might well provide the answer to it. Because whilst um, uh, uh, it, it can clearly be said that this is an abuse of the without prejudice occasion to make a, a deliberately false representation and the court won't countenance a party seeking protection for that, the position is quite different. If one's making an innocent representation, that may well be actionable in another circumstance but can't be categorised as, as an abuse of the occasion. And as I've said, that in my submission is um, what underlies the, the principle in, in exception to that there has to be an abuse of the occasion. Uh, and that um, also, in my submission, is the answer to a point that Mr. Beltrami made on exception two, where he said, well, one of the things, um, one of the things in, in Lord Justice Robert Walker's list is fraud, misrepresentation of fraud and undue influence, and uh, we, we are making an allegation of, of fraud against Dr. Alibabi. Well, so we are, but our allegation uh, is not an allegation based on anything he did at the mediation. Uh, we, we have not pleaded a mediation at all. Uh, it's based on his conduct from 2005 uh, onwards. Um, and uh, it is not suggested that we ourselves at the mediation were guilty of any misrepresentation or, or, or fraud. And that's why misrep the exception to has, it, it, it is not the opposite. Uh, uh, exception in this case. Um, Mr. Beltrami made the same point that the judge made, is to say, well, this is, yes, but you can extend it because this is just, I think, what, the reversal, a mirror image of what Lord Justice Robert Walker, Lord Justice Robert Walker is saying. Um, but that, as I, as I was saying um, before the short adjournment, is, is, is fallacious uh, because it's a false symmetry. It's, it's looking at two different, it's conflating two different complaints. But one being the complaint envisaged by exception two, which is not to abuse the occasion, uh, and one being the complaints discussed in SIB and Finken, uh, which is that um, to, to what extent one can look at the material uh, in order to uh, uh, contradict the case that's been uh, pleaded. And again, Mr. Mr. Beltrami said, well, well Finken's irrelevant because they are not relying on exception four. Um, but um, in, in a sense, that that's that's. Uh, missing the point to the extent that what SIB and Finken shows is that in a situation like the present one, it is to be analysed as the Court of Appeal analysed it under SIB and Finken. That is to say, by looking at the question of when the Court will allow and when it will prevent a party from running a case that is inconsistent with mediation. And that's a, a, a different analysis and a different kind of complaint and a different principle uh, from the uh, one which is raised under exception two which is about misconduct within the, um, uh, within the framework of the mediation itself. And that, of course, is why we say um, not only is the present situation not the one described in exception two, it, it, it's not a principled extension of it either because it's a different kind of complaint. And if it is to be brought within, uh, within an exception, it needs to be a different exception. But SRB and Finken tells us, actually, wh whatever the difficulties may be created in, in particular cases, the overriding public policy means that a party is not permitted to use what was said in the mediation to contradict the later case. Well, that was what I wanted to say on exception two. Um, on, uh, uh, or, uh, I should say, ju just before leaving exception two, um, a, a criticism was made that we have not yet pleaded uh, a positive case on attribution. And Lord, our, our answer, answer to that is that that is, in a sense, to put the cart before the horse. 
if, if and when this material is deemed to be admissible and the, uh, uh, and, and, and the contested pleading that the defendants have made, if that were admitted, then of course we would plead back to it. But our position is that uh, it's not proper for the defendants to have raised the point in the first place because it's held by the average privilege. But on, um, on exception four, um, let me just deal first of all with the, with the, the connection between exception four and waiver. Um, waiver is. Six. Did you mean more? I'm sorry, exception six. Thank you. Exception six. Um, uh, as I think was was um, clear in, uh, in discussion in argument, waiver is a is is, is not an exception at all. Uh, or waiver is a route by which a party can give up its rights under the Act um, and protection, and that's why, of course, it doesn't appear in well, just as Robert Walker's uh, list. Different considerations uh, apply to it. Uh, again, the respondents effectively disavow the waiver case uh, for the judge and have not raised it in their respondent notice. So we do say um, it's not open to them to, at this stage to um, uh, revert back to it. And, 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 it, and, it, and it does, uh, as, as I was um, discussing this morning, have a particular significance in the analysis of exception six uh, because um, it, it is my submission that one only really needs to resort to exception six in the three-party case, because in the two-party case, waiver either will or won't be an answer. Um, on, on, on exception six, I mean, the, 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 the test um, Mr. Beltrami put was put in a slightly di different way as the uh, argument progressed. Of course, one must look at this, first of all, by looking at what the test is, uh, and then at looking at how it should be um, applied. Um, as I understand, the way it's now put is it said, well, once a party has um, raised an issue uh, and the, 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 the without prejudice documents lose their protection, if that issue cannot then be fairly tried without looking at those uh, documents, which is in itself a slight variation on the way that Mr Justice uh, Roth put it. Um, but we do say that, that however the exception is put, whether it's put the way my learned friend put it or whether it's put where Mr Roth, uh, Mr Justice Roth put it, Mr. Justice Riles was right to say that if you do formulate the test in that way by asking the question, well, does a fair trial, based on the issues that have been pleaded, does a fair trial require one to look at the uh, without prejudice material, uh, then it, it, it does consume the, the call it, call it, uh, without prejudice rule. And it is in substance a retreat to a general test of fairness. In other words, the court is ultimately just asking, well, on the basis um, that a particular issue has been raised. Is it, is it fair uh, to look at, or is it, is it sufficiently uh, unfair, or is it fair to look at the without prejudice negotiations? Um, and the right approach, um, therefore, in my submission, is the one that Mr. Justice Miles said, which is that the negotiations themselves uh, have to be put uh, in issue. And that's different from what the defendants are saying uh, is a position here. The effect of the defendant's case is that um, once an issue has been raised in circumstances where the other party wishes to say, well, there was something of relevance to that issue uh, raised at um, uh, on a without prejudice occasion, well, um, if it's sufficiently relevant, the court should allow it in. Uh, thus, thus, it is said in the present case that the fact that the claimants have put uh, their knowledge in, in issue by, by pleading it um, is, uh, is sufficient. Uh, and in my submission, um, it's not, because simply by raising an issue of knowledge does not either expressly or, or by necessary implication uh, put in issue what transpired at the uh, mediation. <coughs> and it does not put it in issue, it does not make it disposable, simply because the defendants wish to say, well, actually, there is some highly relevant piece of information uh, that um, we say was disclosed at the mediation. We would like to rely on it, and we can't have a fair trial without it. And well, that's not the test. The test has to be um, whether the negotiations themselves are put in issue. Uh, and in this case, they weren't. I mean, otherwise, one would end up in a situation where, in, in a sense, whatever fact was pleaded of any kind, the other party would always be able to say, oh, well, now you've pleaded that fact. Uh, that was something that we talked about at length in the mediation, and a lot of uh, relevant and important matters were discussed. Uh, and therefore, it can't be fair for you to raise that fact without allowing me to put the, um, put the without prejudice materials in. 
uh, and that, in, in my submission, would be. Well, in other words, um, if, um, if your pleading were the claimants were at all times, including on the day of the mediation, ignorant of um, uh, Dr. Al Harvey's yeah. ownership of Becker and the payments of Becker and so on, yeah. uh, then the defendants could bring in uh, what was said at in the position paper. Yeah, well, because in that case, we would be making a specific point. But now, Mr. Beltrami's submission is that you are doing that. You are specifically saying that at no time until 2017, which necessarily includes the mediation, did we know this? Well, but, but I, I think there's a difference between those two examples, if, if, if I may say. And, and, and that, that um, implication. But it's there. Oh, it's right, isn't it? You are saying that on no occasion until 2017 did we have this knowledge. Well, we are saying there was no corporate knowledge until oh, 2017. Oh, oh, we've got to leave all that yes, on one side, yes. because that's all. I mean, yes. as you rightly say, yes. that will only be gone into if the evidence is admitted. So, so, so. But, 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 um, but, but I, I don't accept that um, when, in the case, it is said the negotiations are put in issue. It means that, that it's permissible to have that kind of implication. In other words, to say, well, from what you've what you've said in your um, in your pleading, uh, although it's not directed specifically at the negotiations at all, uh, nonetheless, um, the negotiations would be, or the occasion of negotiations would be relevant to that to that allegation, and therefore that allegation must be taken. As encompassing the negotiations. Well, does, does it or does it not encompass the negotiations? That allegation. Uh, well, it, it's it, it is not putting what was said in the negotiations specifically in issue. Sorry, my question was slightly yeah. different. Does your allegation of ignorance until 2017 include or exclude the mediation? But it, it is it is simply an allegation that. Uh, the, 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 the companies did not know. I, mean, I, 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 I find it's a difficult question to answer because. Yeah, I think well, that's sliding into attribution, if I may say so. Yeah. Um, we have not made any allegation about what was or wasn't said. I think the point yeah. is you, you just plead ignorance. Uh, the position might be different if you had specifically yeah. focused on the mediation. It's, if you had pleaded. Yeah. They did not tell us in the, yeah. at any time, including the mediation. Well, You've been slightly it's, more it's, 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 a, it's a bit more than that because, as what one saw in the in the further information, it's not. We were we we said we were not. We were specifically not pleading uh, to what um, uh, what transpired at the mediation. Well, do you accept? Without I, I mean, this is getting quite difficult because you, you do not accept, do you, that that um, that anyone acting on behalf of the company was the company were informed of this at any time. But I mean, you've got to, I mean, the defendants will have to prove that the information was given to X. But the next thing is that X was the agent of the companies for the purpose of receiving that information. But the, the two things, I mean, you could probably avoid this by, by accepting that this information was imparted um, to Eversheds. I mean, if your real argument is not with the fact of the information being imparted, but the, the capacity in which it was received, well, that's a, that's a different point. But I, you don't want there to be in evidence the fact of the statement made at the mediation. Well, we, our position is that that statement is inadmissible, and therefore, or not. Well, right, you don't want it in. No. 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 So no. this isn't an argument about attribution, is it? It's an argument about not getting that at, statement in. At, at, at this stage, of course. No. Uh, this well, I, as I said, if it, this is an argument just about attribution, no. there's no harm in having it in. But, so but I can only assume that you're worried about that statement going in. Well, I, I wouldn't put it that way. Well, you wouldn't be spending all this time no, but, but, <laughs> no, the, the, the position is, is this. Um, if, if the statement goes in, then, then we yes, will be able to it. I understand. But, but, but we yeah. are in, if, if we are right about the scope of without race protection, we are entitled not to have I to understand. deal with it. I understand. All right. Um, and I, mean, I see the point you've already made, but we are we are entitled to say, in my submission, 
that if um, matters are inadmissible because they were covered by uh, the protection, then, then they ought not to be. I yeah. absolutely agree with that. Uh, and, 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 and whether, you know, whether, whether what advantage we do or don't get from that is, is Indeed. Uh, I mean, the, the question is one of yes. that. Yes. Um, my Lord, I, can I just briefly deal with the respondent's notice? Yes. Um, the <laughs> uh, yes. So, so sorry. Just, so, just to complete on, 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 on six, yes. we do say that that's uh, either the waiver analysis applies, or, 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 or there's no exception, and the waiver analysis doesn't apply because yes. by by the plea of knowledge, we, we've not put the negotiations uh, in issue, and, and that's the only basis on which there could be a breach of the protection. Uh, on uh, the uh, on the question of a stop, uh, you know, have seen that the, I mean the judge disposed of the stop on, on the fairly simple basis that uh, Mr. Justice Newberger had said one needs a clear and unambiguous statement, uh, and for the reasons uh, he gave uh, in his judgment at paragraph fifty nine to sixty two, uh, he said there was uh, there was no such statement. Uh, we do also say, however, and in view of the time, uh, I just refer your lordships to our um, skeleton of that. Um, that there is a further distinction to be drawn uh, in estoppel uh, between uh, promissory estoppel of the kind which, which was raised in Hodgkinson and, and estoppels by representation. The, the difference being, or the difficulty being, that if one moves away from the particular situation that uh, Mr. Justice Newberg was dealing with, which was a uh, one party promising not to take uh, some particular action. And if one moves to other kinds of estoppels, which are aimed at um, establishing matters of fact, uh, there is a real difficulty. Because, of course, if a party makes a statement <coughs> of fact uh, at a mediation, that would not then be, a, 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 as an admission, a commission of fact, that would not generally be admissible against him uh, because it's an admission of fact, which is not which is made without prejudice. And it would seem to conflict with that court were nonetheless to allow the other party to say, well, I can't put it against you as an admission, but I can effectively stop you from denying the truth uh, via an, an estoppel route. So there is, there is a, a, a good reason in my submission for confining the uh, estoppel exception to the way in which um, Mr. Justice Newberger put it and the way in which um, uh, Lord Justice Robert Walker uh, accepted it which is that there has, there has to be a, a, a clear statement uh, and, and that it should be limited to the stop. But on the, um, on the independent fact exception, again, this was not a point um, argued by the defendant below, although it is in their respondent notice. Um, the, I mean, whilst, whilst it's true that in, in the uh, Fule case, um, Lord Roger and, and Lord Newberger were not uh, prepared to rule out the possibility of it completely. Lord Roger, in, in particular, was um, uh, was not very enthusiastic about the point. And he said at uh, paragraph 39 in, in a foulet uh, that, he, that he considered the approach to be inconsistent with the general approach uh, of the House of Lords in, in Russian in Tomkin. And even um, in, in the context in which the, um, the exception was discussed, was, as, uh, as, as Lord Newberger said, um, the possibility of admitting a factor which is wholly extraneous um, to the subject matter of the negotiation. And to understand just what, um, what one has in mind by that, uh, what that means to say it's wholly extraneous. Uh, it, the, the only case in which this exception has ever been applied and indeed it's the one which is, I think, referred to in the authority. It's a very old case of Waldridge and Tennyson, yeah. mm -hmm. which was a handwriting case. And clearly, in a case like that, the handwriting has, has really nothing at all to do with the conduct of the negotiation. So um, it's, um, there's, there's little judicial enthusiasm for it. And one can see why it's unattractive, because it requires the kind of dissection of what was said in the mediation. Um, what's of admission, what's of independence and extra fact, which... Um, Lord Justice Robert Walker uh, deprecated in, in, in Unity. 
Um, and, and finally, in the present case, um, it, 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 if, it, it, even if one accepts that um, the point was left open, it was, as I say, left open on the basis that um, it would only be available if it was available at all uh, in respect to things that were wholly extraneous. And in a case like the present one, it, it, it's very difficult to say that something that Lancer chose to put in their position paper for the mediation can be regarded as wholly extraneous to the matters under discussion. Um, why did they put it in if it was, if it was wholly relevant? Uh, and, and again, it will be a uh, most unattractive uh, extension of the without prejudice rule for the court in a case like this to have to analyze the nature of the dispute and what exactly the parties were saying uh, about it in order to find out whether some particular statement either was or wasn't sufficiently extraneous from the dispute in order to justify the application of the uh, extension. So um, we, uh, we say that this exception uh, does not exist. Um, and if it does exist, it would have no application to this. And that's essentially our point. Well, thank you very much yeah. indeed, Mr. Press. Thank you both very much. And those behind you um, will uh, reserve our judgments, circulate them in the usual way, you know what the rules are there, uh, and obviously invite you to agree in order, giving effect to our judgments. If there's any disagreement between you, we'll resolve it on the basis of your written submissions, and the judgment will be handed down remotely in accordance with the current procedures. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. All right.